Hello and welcome uh, to another episode of Armchair Admirals. Uh, this time we had to delay by one week, but uh, I hope uh, you are all here and uh, eager to uh, delve into some naval knowledge as well. Uh, as you know already, I'm Taki. I'm the publishing producer here in the uh, uh, European team and a kind of uh, a very armchair uh, history enthusiast. But uh, obviously in this company I cannot really call myself a historian because that's... And with me there is a Prince Blip uh, mm. from the Legends team. Indeed, I, um, I am one of the community managers for Old Warships Legends. Um, we're over here on console on the Xbox and PlayStation, but um, I'm joining in for the history stream because that is one of my key areas of interest and kind of how I got here. So, um, and I can't really call myself a host historian in, in this company as well, but um, I'm kind of the local historian over on the console side of things um, in, in, a, in, a, in a manner of being. So, but I will pass it on to our guests. Yeah. Uh, joining us are our, our two guests. It's uh, uh, Dr. Alex Clark from uh, at AC Naval History. Hello. And uh, yes, uh, I ha ah here there will be the uh, subtitle. Uh, so uh, hello and uh, welcome from uh, actually not your usual environment. No, I'm off on a research trip, so I'm off wandering. So I'm in a, a, another, a, another time. You keep catching me for these things when I'm in different sort of hotel rooms or accommodations. And this time again, I'm off on a research trip. So I'm off doing some research. Um, I'm hoping to visit uh, St. Moore's, Pendennis and St. Michael's Mount and do some... I take some photos and do some stuff there so I can prepare some slides, kind of like I did for Wales, but on the Cornish Castle. Okay, we have some, uh, some feedback that... Uh... You are probably too quiet, so we are going to adjust a bit. Okay. Uh, I will also oh. adjust mine a bit. Hopefully yes. That, 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 that makes life a little bit easier. Uh, this should be uh, should be better. Is it better? Hello? Better, yes. Better. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, last but not least... We're pleased to welcome uh, Drachinifel from his uh, usual uh, beautiful historical slash sci-fi cave. <laughs> yes. Hello, hello, hello. I am I am still alive. Um, efforts of certain people with pole axes to the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen some pictures. They looked uh, very interesting. Mm, yes, it was even more interesting when I got home and, and discovered a few rather large bruises in the about two areas where that armor didn't cover me, which was interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how I got them because I didn't feel them at the time, but um, someone has videos of the various battles, so I'm, I'm going to be reviewing those and work out which who was who who was the clever clever person who tried to shank me with a pole axe while I was on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and work out how to get your revenge, of course. 
Let's just say I have a very large falchion off to the side at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Oh. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I guess we can now uh, address a bit of drama. Yes. So yeah. uh, for those of you who are wondering on YouTube or Twitch, of course, yes, you, you, you people will be aware of the drama that's been going on over the last uh, few weeks in World of Warships. And I have had a few questions on my channel by email, etc., as to um, whether or not we would be continu continuing with Armchair Admiral. So this is basically the opportunity to explain uh, what's going on from our perspective um so i've written this in coordination with dr clark um and we pre-wrote it so apologies if it sounds a little bit um scripted but it literally is um <laughs> so effectively the drama of the past few weeks definitely hasn't been pleasant to watch and our own personal views of what has occurred are quite strong especially when it comes to the mistreatment of of some uh, and likewise, our own views on some of the business decisions that have been made recently are, are we're quite at odds with some of those decisions that have been made. However, you've got to remember at the same time, the purpose of Armchair Admirals and our involvement in it has been primarily and near exclusively focused on discussion and advancement of naval history, not the details of gameplay. And thus, it doesn't seem reasonable in our view to close off an ad avenue for historical education in reaction to events that are outside of that. Um, now, if you go into the discussion of naval history in academia, we're talking with authors, etc., and you're trying to further the cause of naval history, usually within, obviously within certain limits, but usually it is necessary to put aside personal feelings on the rights or wrongs of any given person's opinions, actions, or theories in order to actually get on with the business at hand. Likewise here, although I personally disagree extremely with the treatment of Little White Mouse, and I am far from the world's biggest fan of some game mechanics, at the end of the day, I'm here on Armchair Admiral specifically to talk about history as a historian. And so if you want to know my feelings on those other matters that are not related to this particular um, set of streams that we do, then that's best discussed elsewhere. So that, that thus concludes the statement. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I will now ask uh, Dr. Clark to actually say something to test whether we've added, uh, we've boosted him enough. Well, hello. Have you boosted me enough, or shall I boost myself? Uh, uh, I, I, I could move the microphone and hold it. Is that better? Uh, I guess so. Uh, sounds okay, apparently. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, yes. Uh, so, uh, what is our topic for today? Our Admiral topic Atlantic. for today, exactly, is the longest battle of World War II, because it started basically immediately, just a few hours after the war was declared by Britain and France, by sinking uh, passenger liner Athenia, which uh, was kind of a big deal even in, in Germany, like... Uh, <laughs> And uh, it ended only by the surrenders in May 1945, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, there was still U boats. Still in war, war patrols. Yeah, there's still yeah. U boats around at the end of the war. Yes, at the same time, it was uh, not only long, but also very, uh, very hard. I mean, uh, I, I think it's uh, illustrative of that the, the German submarines uh, suffered, what, 68% losses? Something yeah. to that extent, right? That's basically being, being, being a U-boat crewman was one of, if not the riskiest jobs in the entirety of the German armed forces in the Second yeah. World War. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's like it's not just losses to enemy action with a submarine. It's any bit of damage, any bit of imperfection in construction can lead to you going down. You are literally yeah. a vessel designed to sink, and if you sink, you're in trouble. Yeah, and and we've all heard the stories of um, of the degradation of building standards um, over time in all countries during the war. Um, every country, to a certain degree, experienced it, um, and I think you know, Germany, in particular, is not one of the great examples of maintaining building quality um, over time. So it's it gets riskier the longer you go. The RN uh, literally had the 
naval constructors. To, that's what the Royal Navy ha uh, had sort of organized in their construction. And I think they expanded the numbers sometimes as something region of three or four times over in order to try and maintain quality control on ship procurement. So yes. they went from a, they were already the largest department of constructors in the world any Navy maintained in World War II to coordinate things, especially across the world, because they were coordinating construction in Canada, in Australia, in India, in America, and repair in America and all, and all these places as well. They had to quadruple. And they were massive. And it's, it's one of those things that we often don't talk about is actually the Battle Atlantic is a big part of that. Because they're having to produce so many ships in so many yards, and they want to produce them to the same standards, so that they, it makes your true crew training easy. Because if every ship, yard produces slightly different ships than the others, then you end up with the same problem the French always have, in that they have a theoretical class of four ships, but actually each one has its own manuals and its own standards and its own training, and it's just a nightmare. So to try and standardize and get the benefits from standardization from multiple yards, you have to have these people going out everywhere going, no, I know it might be easier for you to build it that way, but it's got to be built this way because that's the way all the rest are being built. And you've got to remember as well, there was a lot of disruption to the German economy because the Germans were not too bad at producing ships at times. Um, they, I mean, they pioneered a number of construction techniques, especially towards the end of the war. They were trying to build submarines yeah. in modular sections um, instead of just as a single unit on a, on a slipway or in a dry dock. But amongst various other things, they were hampered by even things as basic as material shortages. Um, if, for people who've studied, you know, the history of land warfare in World War II, you'll know, you know that the Germans had some fairly nifty designs for armor-piercing tank rounds, except that they didn't have anywhere near enough tungsten to make those widely available. So a lot of their armor-piercing shot had to be steel. Even though they knew how they knew how to build better, and they could build better with some of the supplies they had, but they physically didn't have enough to build as many as they wanted. And the same thing applied for aircraft, and the same thing applied for ships, especially when it came to the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, obviously, a U-boat it's largely made of steel, but it's got to go down to very deep depths. Uh, it's going to withstand a lot of pressure. That requires certain types of steel manufactured to certain tolerances, and not only were some of the materials they used to alloy that steel in short supply, which affected the overall quality and what they could produce and the quantities they could produce, um, but even if the factory hadn't been bombed, you also had the fact that to refine the iron and all the other various materials into this steel and all the various alloy ele alloying elements they put into it, all of that also involved an awful lot of energy in terms of burning fuel whether it be coal or oil or whatever because you know it's all it's all metal working and as we know germany by towards the end of the war was running critically low on oil um and all and most other kinds of fuel and the amount of fuel that you need to refine metals is quite significant and then when you translate that into not just you know refining the metals in the first place but then also supplying the energy that you need to forge them, to shape them, potentially to weld or rivet them, depending on what parts of the sub you're, you're doing, it it all translates into an awful lot of energy usage, and there was a limited energy budget as well, uh, on top of all the other issues that were going on. So, that it, it it's not just you know it's wartime; we have to produce things quickly. Quality suffers. It's it's there's a whole raft of material reasons as to why u-boat production took a little bit of a nose diving in quality towards the end of the war yeah. uh, there is a, a quick off-topic question from uh, franta vomachka or vomatska i'm not sure whether he's uh, uh, still speaking Czech. uh hello what does it mean the sig the flag signal behind drag uh so that is a uh, bravo zulu uh, which is the uh, the general signal. I think, I believe it started in the Royal Navy, but I think it's pretty much widely recognised now. Uh, which means well done. Nice, <laughs> cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, the what was that? I'm not sure. I believe I'm about to hear the doorbell go. Ah, okay. Delivery. Okay. Uh, and uh, the USS Grey Ghost is uh, reminding a U-boat that was captured by a US hunter killer group in Chicago Museum. I guess we will get there gradually, because that was quite late in the war. So, 
There are yes, we were. Cool, invi- cool examples of things that go on, and that the the you know the the Battle Atlantic is one of those things where you can almost, you can go through and you can talk about it. You could spend an entire session talking about the surface radar battles in the Battle Atlantic, and I'm not talking about the Grass Bay and the Deutsch. Uh, the other vessels are Deutschen class, and of course, famously, Deutschen herself is out there as one of the first surface raiders, and she's quickly called back. Because Hitler suddenly has a panic attack of what happens if the Royal Navy sinks Deutschland? This might not be good. Call her back quickly. We will rename her Lutzau. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you, you, the the other thing with the Battle of the Atlantic is it's almost unique in terms of the World War Two battles that you can translate the lessons learned in the cat. What's effectively a campaign and put them back into that campaign multiple times. So even something as long as the Eastern Front is still only a portion of the Second World War. And obviously between, um, you know, radical advances in technology and also the different locations that they're fighting in, um, the lessons you learn from any aspect of the Eastern Front can only be translated over for the next few months before something changes um, completely. And you're basically in certain ways almost starting from scratch again whereas with the battle of the atlantic it's fought over the same ocean um between submarines and surface ships and aircraft later on um throughout the entire war so the there's this constant back and forth it's never it's not really a case for most of the war of one side is always winning and one side is always losing um it's one side starts out with an advantage the other side counters then you get a counter to that counter, and then a counter to the counter of the counter, and so on and so on and so forth. There are general trends in terms of overall success levels, and there is generally recognized as kind of a breaking point where, after which the Allies mostly have the upper hand. But even after that breaking point, which is in early uh, 1943, there's a consistent um, change in patterns. And the only way that the, that the Allies tend to stay ahead on that is because they are constantly having to adapt to uh changes that the germans are putting into their tactics if the if the allies had sat back after i think it was os os 55 or os 5 and said okay now guys we we, we've we're winning this and just sat there with the technology and tactics they were using in early 43 then by the end of 43 they would have been back in the sort of the dark days of of late 41 early 42 very quickly but um, it, it does make for a, a fascinating bit of reading. And what's yeah, always most interesting about it is that the tech, and most of the tech you're seeing in 1943, 1944, 1945, the, uh, there, is a, uh, there is sometimes a narrative, but of course by some historians and traditionally, especially because it was hidden in secret developments, um, that this all crops up in World War II. It's all rapid development. And once you go and study it, you realize that most of the navies have been actually developing it for about, from about the 1920s onwards. It's just taken time and to get actually a justify it and b get the financial approval to build it. Yep. And it's um, one of those things. It's a lesson for today, really, in that you never know quite what's sitting in the back pocket somewhere of the various armed forces in the world because they just might not have the government permission to open up the purse strings enough to build it and actually yeah. turn it into reality. Yeah, and I, I mean uh, the other part of that is also that uh, often the uh, military doesn't really care about uh, such pesky things like weight or power consumption so uh, actually they might not be just like ahead of technology in like ahead in technology from the like scientific point of view but they don't care about the drawbacks so they can have this stuff actually i mean just take uh, even the more modern examples the thermal imaging sites on uh, armored vehicles basically the like back then in the 1980s, it was a huge box. I like uh, 50 to 100 kilos, with a lot of specialized and expensive equipment that nobody in the civilian sphere actually had use for. Because well, apart from some specialized scientific establishments, but uh, nowadays we have, uh, thanks to the like thanks to the advances in electronics, we can have handheld units that are far more powerful than anything the army uh, would have back then. But hmm. uh, it's simply just because, yeah, exactly. Your phone can yeah. with an app. Yeah. Uses of thermal imaging. Uh, 
Anyway, I put on uh, quickly two uh, graphs that demonstrate what uh, Drachen Info was talking about. That's uh, This one is the tons sunk by U-boats. You can see the 1942 crisis there quickly. You can also see that basically just, for example, breaking the Enigma did not really help immediately and it didn't help as much because basically Enigma itself was useless for you if we couldn't, couldn't add, act on it. Mm. And yeah. uh, the other thing that's uh, that was still uh, like uh, troubling allies for a long time is this. That's uh, basically a 1941 map, but it demonstrates that basically uh, you had uh, air cover from Britain. At the, uh, basically, at the beginning of war, you didn't even have that much air cover, right? Because uh, it was all uh, like just being set up. But you had air cover from Britain, from... Canada, from Gibraltar, from uh, uh, somewhere around Africa, around the Horn of Africa. Later on, after the uh, invasion of uh, uh, Iceland, you had a cover from Iceland, but that yeah. still left the huge, huge black hole in the middle of the Atlantic where you didn't have any air cover, mm -hmm. where you also had trouble getting uh, escort ships into because the destroyers were quite fuel hungry. They often couldn't get uh, all the way there. And even if they could, you didn't have actually that many of them, right? Because they were... Like... They needed for other things. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. the thing. You have to remember, the destroyer numbers are needed for other things. And the, 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 and also the destroyers that are used are the VMW destroyers. Are they quite, are they're the World War One legacy destroyers, which have mostly been, they've gone run. We will take out some of the high intensive power units so they take off their top speed. And we'll take off some of the torpedoes. We'll take off also on this stuff, and we're just adding more fuel and uh, uh, more fuel mm. and more people to just AA weapons to just so they can get out there. But you also have the problem that you know when we start talking about this whole this preparation, one of the things that often comes up when I'm talking to students is why didn't the British start producing long range escorts in the 1920s? And I go, they were, they were called the sloops, but they weren't producing that many of them because they had three likely war scenarios. One of them was Italy, one of them was Japan, and Germany was a way down a list of real possibilities because, let's be honest, Germany in the 1920s is not as big a threat as it becomes. And even in the beginning of the 1930s, it's not as big a threat as it becomes. And even in 1939, you can make the case that militarily, frankly, Italy and Japan looked far bigger threats than Germany did to Britain. And if you're preparing to fight a war against Japan or against Italy... That requires a different fleet than fighting a war against Germany. And the um, Royal Navy couldn't pick which one it was going to end up fighting. So it had to try and do its best to use the limited budget it had, prepare for any war scenario against either one of those three, or their, their hope was that it would be a maximum of any two of those three, and their absolute nightmare, which they're basically going, you would need to give us a lot more money for to prepare, would be all three. Yep. Because that yep. was the nightmare scenario. Uh, Commander Smoggy is saying that uh, there is a blue dot on that map uh, that was my father's ship. Well, uh, I'm glad to know that your father made it okay, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah the, the, um, the air gap obviously was eventually closed by a combination of aircraft generally becoming slightly longer range. Uh, the introduction of much longer ranged aircraft completely so um b24 liberators and their navalized equivalents amongst other things were very useful in that respect um but also you have a rather interesting um little little uh should we say diplomatic coup if you like which is um involves portugal and the azores uh, i don't know if anyone else knows what i'm talking about mm -hmm. no? So um, the oldest alliance gets activated. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, how you how you use a treaty from the era of the longbow to help you win World War II, uh, which is basically Portugal is neutral, although politically slightly in favour of the Allies, but um, they they are towing a fine line because they don't they don't want to get directly involved. They're partly worried about initially how the war's going to go completely, also perhaps more significantly worried about what franco spain may or may not do since they know that spain is most more closely allied with the germans than the allies and they're kind of the opposite and 
Historically, Spain has had its eye on, you know, Portugal not existing or becoming part of Greater Spain. So they've got all these considerations to work into. But one of the one of the ways that they are managing to negotiate these rather difficult diplomatic waters is the Portuguese, uh, I believe it's president, is very, very straight and by the book. He says, OK, if the law says this or treaty says this or our agreement says this, we will do this and we will do exactly this and we will not do anything more or anything less. And that doesn't necessarily please everyone, but they can't exactly argue with it because they're usually the ones who wrote the treaty or the agreement. And in the middle of all this, uh, you have the U-boats uh, campaigning out in the middle of the Atlantic, which is all very bad. And someone points out, well, you know, the Azores are near enough as so it makes no difference in the middle of the Atlantic. It'd be really useful if we could base some nice big long range maritime patrol aircraft out of there. And point out, yeah, but they belong to the Portuguese, so we can't. And you then have these two schools of thought. The Americans, uh, who by this point are involved in the war, basically want to do the same thing that they did with Iceland and just. You know, the Allies turn up one day with a bunch of military force and say, hi guys, well, we're now in charge of these islands. Take it or leave it. Well, actually, we're going to take it anyway because we have lots of guns and you don't. Um, which theoretically would work. There wasn't anything like enough Portuguese troops in the Azores to stop them. But it would have meant that Portugal would, by default, have ended up at war with Britain and America because... Well, one, they can't really ignore someone just rolling up and taking part of their territory. And two, even if they did, that would be a fairly significant departure from their we're following a by the book, by the letter policy. And then Germany and Spain would be looking at them going, oh, OK, so you're prepared to make exceptions for them, but not for us. Right. You're not actually being a neutral party anymore. Guess it's annexation time. Um, and the British know this and they realize that this is that wouldn't be the best route to go down, although they do keep the option open. So, but as a, as a first stage in, before that, they say, no, hang on, let, let us let us try a diplomatic solution. We think we have a plan. And the Americans take a look at this plan and they go, this is ridiculous. It's never going to work. It's far too old. Uh, and what the British do is they dig up the eternal treaty of friendship and cooperation that was signed in the 1300s after a small for force of English longbowmen showed up and helped the Portuguese king retain his throne. And it, uh, amongst other things, it basically says that in perpetuity, our enemies are your, uh, uh, your enemies are our enemies, our friends are your friends, and vice versa. So the British dig up this treaty and they head down to Portugal and say, you know, there's not an expiration date on this treaty. And no one's renounced it, even though at one point the British actually lost their copy and had to reconstruct it from secondary sources in the Victorian <laughs> period. That's how old this thing is. Um, <laughs> And they they say, look, we're not asking you to go to war with the Axis powers. But, but it would be it, nice if you could. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it does say that, you know, our enemies are your enemies. And all we're asking, since we obviously now have mutual enemies, is you let us base us some aircraft in the Azores to fight those enemies. And the Portuguese president takes a look at it and goes, yep. The, the letter of the treaty says that you have, we need to cooperate with you on this. And since it's a relatively small thing, you're not asking us to. We're not asking us to like launch another peninsula campaign. I can go along with this. But again, to comply with the technical letter, the treaty is between Portugal and, the, well, at the time, England, now the United Kingdom, not with anyone else. So you can't have any Americans there, just British. And the British, okay, fine, we can do that. <laughs> the Americans can be base out of Iceland, we'll be nice in the tropics in the Azores. And then um, a few weeks later, when there's um, RAF Coastal Command aircraft floating around, Hitler and uh, and company are absolutely furious and phone up the Portuguese and, why have you done this? What's going on? You, you, you're siding with the Allies. And the president just said, I follow the letter of the law exactly. We had a pre-existing treaty with them. I was legally obligated to to run with it. And, um, you know, in my defense, you know, I'm not at war with you. We, they're just basing out of those islands. If you want to go and you know, fight them in the Azores, uh, well, you know, there's not a lot I can do to stop you. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm following my policy. And uh, the Germans just like, well, 
he's technically correct <laughs> which as we all know is the best kind of correct so they, they kind of they have to leave they have to leave portugal alone because you know they've got this open invitation to go and deal with the Zors if they want of course the portuguese know full well there's no way the germans can get there uh in any great numbers and so you have th this wonderful scenario of um uh, 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 of this ain't literally multiple hundred year old treaty being used to help win the battle of the atlantic uh, I mean, uh, kind of it was uh, from the like standpoint of uh, keeping to the letter of the neutrality, technically. Mm. It was kind of the same as uh, the cash and carry, right? But yeah. Basically. Yes. Uh, okay, G Germany was theoretically free to also go shopping in the USA, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, but they'd have to get yeah. past the British to get there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's also... British would have taken the cash and the carry. Uh, it also reminded me that there was this small kind of independent uh, uh, town in uh, Britain that uh, was technically it, at war with Russia since the Crimean War, right? Until the yeah. 1960s. Yeah, Beric upon Tweed. The one, yeah. the one, they, they had a wonderful peace, peace uh, treaty signing ceremony in the middle of the Cold War because of that. <laughs> that was, um, yeah, yeah that, that's, a, that's a completely separate side issue but it basically comes about from Berwick upon Tweed being fought over so much by the English and the Scots that um, I think it was when the Act of Union came around uh, neither side wanted to allow Berwick to be technically claimed by the other side so um, when the declaration of war came around it was you know, Queen Victoria uh, you know, Queen of well, Empress of India, Queen of England, Scotland Ireland, Wales, etc. All the various titles that Queen Victoria had and Berwick upon Tweed. But when they signed the peace treaty, somebody didn't include Berwick upon Tweed in the peace treaty. I uh, think it was a Foreign Office civil servant from Berwick on Tweed who thought, you know what, we can still take the Russians. Even without the rest, we can do this. So for a century and a half, technically Berwick upon Tweed was at war with Russia. <laughs> winning considering the size of Beric on Tweed versus Russia yeah. and that they were still there. They were winning the war. <laughs> yes. uh, we have a question in uh, uh, on Twitch chat uh, from uh, Miggip uh, Zero. Uh, question for, for the gentleman. What was the role of the Canadians in the Battle of the Atlantic? And uh, well, I think this and the following image are mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, illustrative of that. Canada had a lot of those. Yes. Canada builds up the third largest navy in the world by numbers of vessels and tonnage during World War II. They are third to America and Britain. And their, their navy is unique in that it doesn't have battleships, it doesn't have an aircraft carrier till really the end, and it doesn't really have many cruisers until the end. It has a couple of few tribal destroyers and a few other destroyers, and but really what it has is corvettes, and frigates, and trawlers, uh, and corvettes, uh, and frigates, yes. and trawlers, and corvettes, and frigates, <laughs> and trawlers, and corvettes, and frigates, and trawlers. <laughs> and here's the thing. Odds are, if you put the entire Canadian Navy versus Yamato or any of the Japanese super battleships, they would win by literally just having so many that of ships that the battleship would run out of shells before the Canadians ran out of ships. <laughs> It's literally, it's that large. They're in the Battle of the Atlantic, when we talk about it, it's often it's said as it's Britain versus Germany. No, no, in many ways, it's Canada versus Germany. Because Canada just churns out and builds all these escorts. And they're just churning them out and churning them out and churning them out. And it's, you know, at one point, the Canadians, I think, had more escorts doing anti-submarine warfare operations off the coast of America and Britain than America and Britain did, as well as escorting convoys. I no. think that was at a point in 1944. Uh, uh, to be fair, uh, it could have been true even before that, because, I mean, we will get to it, but uh, uh, having more uh, ships doing anti-submarine work on the East Coast than America wasn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Not, uh, yeah, early on, yeah. that wasn't, wasn't the, exactly yeah. too difficult. But, uh, yeah. but uh, there is a question from... Uh, uh, Meat Pie Man, is that a fishing boat with guns? And I, I believe the answer is... In very broad terms, yes, right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. The um, the flower much. class corvettes were based on a commercial design um, for a fishing dash. Depending on which source you read, either a fishing trawler or a whaling trawler 
or it was a, a whaling trawler. Whaling trawler. So yeah, um, okay. but yeah, it, it, it's a commercial design. The, they effectively turned around and said, well, one, we need a, a, a pre-existing design to work from because we don't have time uh, to design yep. it. And we need it to be known to work in pretty much any sea state and have a fairly decent range. And that meant basically going to the commercial fishing industry. The other aspect of it was because it was a pre-existing commercial design, even if you modified it, obviously, to have guns and depth charges and such like, it meant the basic hull could be built in commercial yards which was a huge issue because obviously for obvious reasons the naval yards and the navy capable commercial yards were rather busy building cruisers and battleships and carriers and destroyers and repairing a bunch that the germans and the italians and the japanese had poked holes in so the, if you're going to churn out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of escorts you don't want to be occupying those yards with them but there's loads of these smaller commercial only yards that have loads of experience building ships like this and then by adapting that into what becomes now the flower class corvette they're able to um, in increase the production numbers without affecting full-on military ship production and, and a number the of them is... go back to being at, um, commercial well go back to being they are turned into commercial vessels post-war yep. and the thing oh, is really? the rn knew what they were looking for because when they've been doing it in the 1920s and 30s, you have to remember there was a whole category of ship called sloops, which were the RN terms were called sloops and other navies called different things, which had certain rules. They could build as many as they liked, but they were limited to a maximum displacement of 2,000 tons. They were limited to a top speed of 20 knots, and they could only carry a certain number of guns and couldn't carry torpedoes. In other words, they are anti-submarine warfare exports. And the Royal Navy had pushed for this to be included in the treaties. And they've used the 1920s and 30s to build small batches of this. They hadn't built large numbers of them, although they had the capability to if they needed to. They'd built small numbers of them. And they'd worked out exactly what they needed for an anti-submarine warfare escort to work. So when they were deciding on the size of hull and which ship to pick, they already had worked out what that ship needed on it so they could go... Okay, this is the size of hull we need. So what hull fits that requirement? So they already worked out all the naval and military stuff, the stuff they needed to fit into the hull. So it's basically starting off with, this is all the stuff we need to fit in. Which hull's big enough? Commercial, boom, put it together. And the thing is, this process starts off in about 1937. And the first discussion, DNC's drawing up, making decisions and drawing up designs in 1938. And January 1939, they start to make the orders. And by, by July 1939, they're starting to be laid down. So if you think about it, the, this whole program is starting with the R Britain preparing for war roughly based on a 1942 likelihood of it turning up. And um, this is the point. They've actually got the escorts, the flower class, etc., and all sorts of things actually on order before World War II begins. These aren't, you know, the Battle Atlantic and these ships which are so much famous for Battle Atlantic, and it kind of proves what me and Drax say so often, you go to war with what you have. You often fight the war with what you have and what you already had on order before the war, because it's, it, it, the war does not tend to accelerate the entrance into service of new things. It tends, okay. to, enter, enter, it, it tends to speed up the into service of existing things. And... Luckily, the Brits had a fairly good design ready to go, and they had it in the yard. They had it designed so it could be built in yards all around the world. It wasn't just ordered in Britain. It wasn't just ordered in Canada. You have flower class corvettes being ordered everywhere. Uh, the British at one point are hunting for yards in South Africa. They are building some in India. There are some which are going to be being built in Singapore, which end up being cancelled when, you know, because they're taking so long to get built, they just get cancelled. And so everywhere in the world that could build these ships, they were trying to build them. Yeah, and uh, speaking of basically what were the like what were the requirements, what had to fit the Corvette? It was fairly frugal, right? It was one four-inch gun, one uh, pom pom, two machine guns usually, I believe, and. Uh, Depth charges, yeah, yeah. Just, and something but like what twelve knots. Yeah, it but, didn't uh, need to be heavily armed. It didn't need to be. Its purpose was if a submarine was on the surface, it was going to get taken out by that gun or damaged enough to the point at which that submarine, if it dived, is going to be in trouble. That was the point of it. 
and depth charges were the best things that are available and it needed to be large enough to hopefully carry Aztec and all these things which is you know it, it, that's what it was for and it the doesn't thing, need to be amazing the other thing you've got to remember when it comes to the battle of the atlantic is although the u-boat campaign is kind of the biggest element of it it's the most famous element of it there are multiple aspects to it so um, you've got these small escorts being built but you've also got to account for two types of surface threat and an air threat so you've got the german air threat which most commonly is held up with things like the uh, fw200 condor um, sometimes acting as a recon aircraft to find convoys and tell the u-boats where to go uh, but also at times acting as an attack aircraft and that that causes issues so that drives a whole other element of ship design in the battle of the atlantic so you get um, catapult armed merchantmen merchant aircraft carriers and later escort carriers uh, trying to deal with that that part of things and then you also have the disguised commerce raiders the hilfskreuzer or Hilfskreuzer, I can't remember exactly whether there is a plural lesson there, um, which are basically pur purpose-converted mer German merchantmen that have been turned into auxiliary cruisers, but hidden, so they go around with their guns disguised until the last possible moment, then drop the disguise and open fire. Uh, one of them, Cormoran, famously accounting for HMAS Sydney in a mutual kill engagement off of Australia. And on top of those disguise ships you've also got the occasional visits to the atlantic from the full-on german warships um the deutschland class the Scharnhorsts, for a brief period the bismarck as well um and they're they're all, and various admiral hipper class at some point at various points also and they're also heading out with objectives to destroy allied convoys and all of these require different threats because obviously with the the, the condors you can up the anti-aircraft armament of ships but one you can only do so much for, with small ships and merchant ships and two they can just circle beyond your range and report where your position in extremis hence the aircraft element and with the surface ships you also have to make some other adjustments because the Hilfskreuzer even just even they outgun something like a flower class corvette they've got multiple guns they usually got cruiser grade weaponry okay they're not particularly durable but neither is a corvette so you have to have destroyers and you have to have cruisers around to help deal with them and then you've got the threat of the much larger ships the Scharnhorsts, the deutschlands and the um bismarcks in particular and for that the battle of the atlantic also involves a bunch of older battleships going around so there's this multi-layered approach to how the allies are defending against the various forms of german attack and that's before you get to what they're doing to go on the offensive against them not just sort of passively trying to defend the convoys yeah, it's one yeah, of the reasons why when bismarck gets sunk there's quite so many british battleships all uh, not too far away you know we, we talk about of course her be, uh, you know her getting sunk by rodney and king george V. well there's lots of other ones sitting around there's hms renown not that far away there's some r class there's some other other battleships all quite close by and you know this is the one of the things which often goes on with that what if scenario because people often go oh well you know what if bismarck does manage to somehow get away and sink or sink king george V and sink rodney somehow well, then about a couple of hours later, they'll be finding themselves facing another ship, uh, another battleship or battlecruiser's 15-inch guns. And, um, well, that will be probably all they wrote, because if they manage to sink those two battleships, they probably have taken a lot of pummeling themselves, and another one turning up is just going to be it's in a good night. Didn't actually one of the R-classes uh, turn up also for the... During the terrible twins sortie, uh, yes, there yeah. was an uh, th th there was a Malaya as well. That they yeah. Um, yeah. yeah the Shan horse they they saw Malaya sailing along and just went, it's not worth it. Yep. <laughs> We're going yes. somewhere else. Um, and that's during, the point. Uh, yeah, and and during that phase of operations, Operation Berlin, um, there was also actually um, Rodney very nearly managed to kill Gneisenau. Um, believe it or not, because they were still operating under sort of cruiser rules of engagement, where you stop the ships and search them. And Gneisenau had found a lone merchant ship, um, stopped it, shot at it a little bit, was um, dealing with the aftermath. 
But what they didn't realize was that A, the ship had got distress call off, and B, that distress call had been received by HMS Rodney, which was nearby. So Rodney piles on the steam to go and see if it can help. And so in the in the sort of the, the gathering darkness of dusk, uh, the captain of Gneisen is looking over the uh, captured ship and sees the the shape of Rodney come boiling over the horizon at full pelt. Yeah. And of course, any steam turbine powered warship takes a while to get up to speed. So Gneisen now is much faster than Rodney is. But right now, it's only doing about 10 to 12 knots. Um, and Rodney's doing 24-ish something. Captain Dalrymple Hamilton had an interesting um, habit of when he absolutely needed to, getting Rodney to go at speeds that were probably slightly unsafe for the engineering crew. And it, it's now this kind of equation of, okay, Rodney's coming in. How quickly can we accelerate? Because if if Rodney can close the distance before we hit mid the mid twenties of knots, we're probably dead. Um, but if we can you know, get up, gradually slow that closing down by accelerating ourselves, and then we can get up to speed, we might live. And for about 10, 15 minutes, it's right on the knife edge. Rodney's got its guns ranged up and ready to go. And then Gnizar managed to hit that, that sweet spot of speed and gradually starts pulling away and uh, Dak Captain Darren Paul Hamilton is is left to deal with the, again the survivors of the ship that Gnizar had been de dealing with earlier. Um, but it, it literally comes down to how how good are the German engineers in their boiler rooms, and how sharp is the lookout <laughs> in the top vast uh, as to whether or not Rodney uh, chalks up what would have been her first German battleship kill at that point, because that predates the Bismarck's voyage. So that there's and a lot of close calls at that point. And Dalrymple and Hamilton, it sits there complaining that the Royal Navy should have built the F3 rather than the Nelson and Rodney design, because then he'd have had a few extra knots, and Nisenau would never have got away from him then. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, what is also illustrative is that during the Charnhorst and Nisenau sorties and during the Okid okay, battleship sorties in the 1940, uh, 1949, 1940 timeframe, the convoys they encountered were escorted just by armed uh, merchant ships and uh, by uh, by sloops, right? There were not even enough corvettes to go with the convoys to... There were a few corvettes going around, but we're yeah. not talking about the mass that comes in later yeah. on. It takes yeah. time to build these things. And again, yes. it's one of those, uh, those things you cannot click your fingers and go, build ships. Yeah. You, yeah, there's a bunch of smaller it, things. It takes away ages. There's a bunch of small I mean, ships, there's armed yeah. trawlers and things that are being put in a lot as well at that point. And to be honest, armed trawlers are still around for the majority of the war. But there's this whole graduation of, you know, anything. Initially, it's anything we can fit a depth charge to. Uh, and later yeah. on, they're a little bit more selective. But uh, very uh, early on, it is it is pretty desperate. Although at one point, yeah. some of the landing craft for D-Day were apparently also fitted with, la with depth charges. So perhaps... You know, they also get less selective at certain points, depending on circumstances. Yep. Yeah, uh, and I mean, it's not enough. Uh, I, I mean, the Germans had the same problems because they also didn't have that many submarines to begin with at the onset of the war. And basically, the, the, the other big, rather large elephant in the room is that even if you build all the ships, you also need crews, right? And you need to train the crews and you need the especially trained officers who know what they are doing on the sea kind of so that and, and not only for not only for the escorts but also for the merchantmen yeah um, you need to have experienced crewmen in the merchantmen who at least at least know how to sail if not um to sail together and you need to train them how to how to work together as well in the whole convoy system which is new to them as much as anybody else um it's a whole there's a whole human factors element that um that works into it uh, uh, yeah, it's one of those things. This is all quite long term and coming. And one of the other things I also would sort of like to point out is I'd like to introduce people to a name because they might have heard of him, they might not have. But everyone associates the German World War II plan with Reda or Donitz. And actually, they are both just disciples of another gentleman called Holzendorf, Henning von Holzendorf who was the head of the German Imperial Admiralty Staff 1915 to 1918 in World War I. And he was the one who basically said, 
the only way we can ever stand a chance against Britain is if we can wage... Basically, it's a version of asymmetrical warfare and cut off their ability to uh, provide sufficient supplies by the sea. The thing he's always very clear of, it's not... You cannot cut off all their, their ability to get all their supplies in. You'll never be able to do that. It's not like a COVID zero situation where you're aiming for zero COVID. You can't, he, he, he said you couldn't do that with the spice. You need to cut off enough. And it's him who starts coming up with the theory of you need at least 300 submarines for this to be able to have 100 available. And that's always what Raider and Donets later are always pushing for, to have 100 submarines. And you look at the, those peak points are usually from the points at which the Germans start to get 100 submarines available or plus, 100 plus submarines available in the Atlantic. Uh, we have a question here, actually, from uh, uh, USS Great Ghost, uh, aimed specifically at Drakenifel. What about the Liberty ship that sank a commerce raider in a gunfight in the Atlantic off the coast of Africa? Actually, didn't hear about such a thing happening. Yeah, that was uh, What's again the story? A, um, a mutual. That was a mutual kill scenario. Um, it was one of the smaller German raiders, um, and and basically what what happened was this because all the liberty ships were armed to uh, a certain degree and the german surface raider showed up at fit relatively close range ordered the liberty ship to sort of stand down and and haul over there was also the uh, supply ship for the merchant rate for the surface raider but it was standing off a bit because you know it's full of supplies and not particularly armed itself but the Liberty ship refused to go down and in, uh, and stand down and instead opened fire with its uh, small array of weaponry. But because in in some ways it was almost a almost a reverse situation of what happened with Cormoran and Sydney, or in some ways actually to be honest, similar if you look at the disparities of strength. And although the German ship fired back because of the close range and the fact that both sides were relatively un unprotected and um, then the sufficient damage was inflicted on both sides that the while the Liberty ship sank, the German service raider also sank and the survivors were left to be picked up by the German resupply vessel, which had to come in and help. And then obviously um, when other allied ships showed up, it had to withdraw. But it was a it was basically a one on one mutual kill scenario. And you have to remember, the arming of Liberty ships and all these things was a sort of grey area. In that, technically, you're not allowed to... If you turn them into... Give them enough weapons, i.e. offensive weaponry, they become an armed merchant cruiser and you have to register that. But if you can give them weapons which you consider self-defence weapons, especially if they just happen to be a general purpose mount, but theoretically an AA weapon, you can get away with a lot. And it also depends on the quality of the, of the crew that you've got there. Because if the captain is sort of not prepared to hedge his bets then you're not going to open fire at all but even if you do that then you're you're talking about very basic weaponry we're not talking about yeah. contemporary world war ii weaponry with range finders and radar fire control etc it is usually literally one guy with a pair of binoculars standing next to an open gun mount and how how good are your gunners at estimating range and how good is your guy with binoculars at estimating the corrections that need to be made and in that kind of scenario, that is that those kind of minor human details can be the difference between, you know, freighter fired, which some other freighters confronted by German surface raiders did fire back. But a lot of the time it was a case of, yeah, it fired a handful of shells. They fell somewhere in the vicinity of the raider and the raiders much better gun crews um, devastated the merchant ship in this particular case. It just so happened they weren't expecting resistance and the gunners on the Liberty ship were considerably better than average. Their captain and they were both quite keen on practicing. Um, I seem to remember one other story was he had a, because he had different groups of crew practice on the guns and the ones who did the best job got a, a bottle of whiskey or something like that. I, I seem to remember there was a story behind why they were such a good gun crew, but basically he'd had a running competition because he'd been a, a reserve officer or something in one of the nation's reserves and uh, so he was very keen on them being able to deal with it if they were going to be doing this area if they're going to be doing these sort of trips and so he'd had a running competition and it happened to be his best but gun crew were able to, to man the guns yeah 
Okay, I uh, didn't hear about this incident, so that's uh, that's mighty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ship is a new special ship to the um, World of Warships running around. People could be in a Liberty <laughs> ship that surprises people and goes boom, boom, boom at them. <laughs> Tier well, one. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean... Tier one, Merchant Cruiser. <laughs> Liberty ship. Uh, yeah, I, I mean the combination of one Dutch oiler and uh, one uh, Indian Navy minesweeper managed to sink a Japanese uh, commerce raider, right? So mm -hmm. that's... yeah, you know these things happen. <laughs> uh, especially since uh, I mean most of the commerce raiders basically had no no protection for the gun mounts or anything. So on the in the Japanese raider case, it's uh, disputed whether it was a torpedo fire or ready ammunition fire but in any case basically no protection and the ship just went up uh, very quickly uh, but uh, okay so this was basically happening from the onset of the war but uh, the i mean the the convoys and their protection was gradually getting better but then then the U.S. got involved. <laughs> yeah, then the U.S. got involved, and we have several juicy questions, one of them in chat, so I'm actually taking them because it's uh, it helps us to move the narrative along. So on Twitch, it's Hetman Mazepa. In the pre-selected questions, it was Lex Mechanic and Nati Nati, but uh, basically all uh, were asking a similar question uh, that... Uh, uh, the uh, the extent uh, to which the USN seemed uh, initially powerless to stop attacks on US shipping, the happy times, the second happy times, is extreme. Was it really a deliberate refusal to learn from Royal Navy's experience or just lack of suitable ships? It was it's, actually a reality of the situation. It's, 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 a, it's a, yeah. Sorry. I, 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 there's just this one thing I want to say because I want to defend Admiral King on this one. Admiral King had been preparing the US Navy to fight the war they thought they were going to have to fight, which was against Japan. This is kind of mm -hmm. like the Royal Navy are preparing to fight, well, we might have to fight the Italians, we might have to fight the Germans, we might have to fight the Japanese. Who are the Americans thinking about fighting? The Japanese. Mm -hmm. That's a very different fleet you need to fight the Japanese in the Pacific than you do need to wage an Atlantic uh, convoy war in the Atlantic. And part of the trouble he has is when it comes into, yes, you might learn to start learn from the British and start doing convoys. But first of all, you need the ships, which can actually do the convoy escorting. And secondly, you need the people available to learn to do the convoy work. And where are the best of the US Navy all being sent? To the Pacific at this point, especially to get over Pearl Harbor and the impact of Pearl Harbor and then Coral Sea and then Midway. Yes, they're successful and Guadalcanal, they're successful. Well, hey, but they lose a lot of ships and a lot of good people in these fat battles. And that's before we get on to what happens to Abda and all the others. So the Americans lose a lot of their very good people, a lot of their very tra skilled, trained people to the Pacific. Either lose them completely or lose them because that's where they need to send the people. And this causes King to have to make decisions. And some of them, we can argue in hindsight, we can sit there and go, that's a stupid decision. He should never have done that. But he's trying to do the best he can with the situation he has available. And yes, to an extent, he's probably buying himself a lot of political coverage by saying, no, 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 we don't need to learn from the British. We know we can do it our own way because there is no way he can do it the British way because he hasn't got the escorts. He hasn't got the ships. He hasn't got the people. The only way he can do it the British way is if King does something which is a complete anathema to him and would cause him huge trouble in in, in the Congress and with the American government. And that's go, okay, we need British and Canadian escorts to come and do the work for us because we don't have the ships. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's a combination of pragmat pragmatism and practicality. King's attitude to the British really doesn't help because if you look at it from a completely pragmatic perspective, you know, yes, the US doesn't have as many escorts as it would like. It does have a fair number of coastal based aircraft that could help. You know, you could also either via central government, via state government, even via city government, tell them to switch the blasted lights off the coastal cities, which really, really doesn't help because you've got all this coastal traffic going up and down and the U boat sitting there at night going, Okay, well, I'll just sit off of this town that's nicely and brightly lit up, and when a shadow silhouette passes across it, oh, look, that's a merchant ship. I can very easily do my calculations, send my torpedo downrange, and bang, there goes the merchant ship. So <laughs> there is, there are things that the US could have done to mitigate the impact before, you know, just going, hands up, we can't do it, we need the Canadian and British navies to show up and off our coast. 
but you know king doesn't do a lot of those and he doesn't press for a lot of those um in part because it's the british who are suggesting them and he does he does for all of his you know his strengths he does have a fairly anglophobic streak in him when it comes to the british institutions generally weirdly enough he gets on with a number of key players within the admiralty like somerville uh mountbatten uh cunningham etc he actually gets on very well with them as mm. individuals but uh, uh from an institutional level of will the u.s navy um learn and accept lessons from the british or will we accept help from the British? He's absolutely against that. Uh, there's various reasons for that, a lot of which goes back to the First World War. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, and it do it really doesn't help the, the situation. Because from a purely pragmatic perspective, you know, if you don't have the ships, get your allies to help out. It saves lives, it saves shipping. It's a, the best thing to do, but it, it's, a, it's a bit of a blind spot for King. He's determined not to allow it to occur. <laughs> Uh, and it it does it's it starts to get to the point of absurdity a bit later on in the war past that that um well, obviously what the germans are calling the second happy time um wherein one even once the us has the escort numbers so us escorts are showing up in fairly large numbers with convoys that are going across the atlantic um and amongst other things showing up in liverpool where western approaches command is based which is where the, the British, the main British effort against the U-boats is, is being um, worked out from. And uh, what they have there is they have what's called the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, amongst other things. And you can go and visit it. The Western and Approaches Command is a museum now. Uh, it's a very good museum as well. <laughs> um, but Western Approaches Tactical Unit is made up almost entirely of Wrens, uh, which is the uh, the women, the Women's Royal... Uh, Navy service, yeah. uh, WRNS, but yeah. they call them Rens because it flows easier off the tongue. And what they're doing is actually a form of double-blind wargaming on a very large, uh, in a very large room at the top of the building. And they are taking all the tactics that are being reported as what the Germans are using out at sea, and they're combining that with their knowledge of what the currently available counter tactics are, and they're playing out scenarios over and over again in this in this room and they're the ones who are doing most of the working out as to how you can counter the german tactics obviously the ships at sea are working out their own counters actively there but because they can repeat these exercises over and over and over and over again and they can have a neutral umpire to see how things are going even though they're limited to the view of what they could see from a, an escort vessel they're able to develop these things a lot faster and a lot more efficiently to the point that they even have some fairly experienced british submarine commanders come in at various points to uh play the role of u-boat captains so these are professional sub submarine commanders yeah. they know what they're doing they're fighting obviously in a wargaming environment to try and sink the convoys and the Wrens are capable of beating them repeatedly. Oops. And then, so when these escorts come in, um, all the captains and some of the senior officers are invited in, and the Wrens and the officers in charge sit them down and say, right, well, while you've been out in the Atlantic, here are the new tactics we've developed to try and counter the, what the Germans are doing. And this is one of the main ways of information being disseminated, because apart from anything else, you know, the escorts are there because they're in Liverpool anyway. And by physically going in and having these lectures, it's impossible for the Germans to intercept these new tactics before the new tactics are utilised out at sea. And the US officers who are present in Liverpool, they want to learn as well. But Admiral King has, um, we know this from documentation that Western Approaches Command has, Admiral King has issued explicit orders that his officers his american officers are forbidden from attending these lectures purely and simply because they are lectures by the british no other reason if those lectures were being given in america by american um officers he'd be fine with it but purely because they're british officers he doesn't want his officers to have anything to do with it he, as far as he's concerned if there's any new tactics to be developed for u.s navy ships the u.s navy will either develop them or they won't that that's that um as it turns out the u.s officers do actually come up with a bit of a workaround for that because of course while they're in dock sunday is a day off um and therefore they're not under any orders they're at liberty they can go wherever they like in the city and a bunch of them come to a quiet working arrangement with the british that you know 
if you would happen to put on a, an early afternoon anti-submarine tactics lecture on a Sunday, then you know we might we might spot you a few rounds at the pub at the, later that night, and they end up taking the lessons and applying them anyway. Um, so yes. yeah, th wh while about... there is a lot to be said in Admiral King's defence in terms of resource resource shortages, he does have a very strong anglophobic streak as well, which really does not help in this scenario. And the other advantage in that is that a lot of the Americans would, if they're senior officers, if they're captain, let's say the XO wanted to do it and the other things, but the captain wanted to follow King's orders, uh, then they were just going to see their English girlfriends. And yes. if you would like to know more about it, I'm holding this up. And the reason I'm holding this up is it's a very, very good book. gets very little attention. It's called A Game of Birds and Wolves by Simon Parkin. And it's all about this. And it's um, an absolutely brilliant book. And it's it's incredibly cheap on amazon and various other places so i highly recommend it if you want to learn about this yeah and if you want it in video form i believe i saw a video from uh, mr lindybesh i believe uh, on this very topic which was a very useful condensed format of the physical development of this uh yeah uh, there is a comment from dan freeman uh the convoys reduce kill rate even without escort uh in general, yes, but I'm not sure if it's applicable to the US coast situation because the main advantage of a even unescorted convoy out in the Atlantic is that it's almost as hard to find as a single ship, right? Whereas if the you US, have a... they're going between port and port and therefore they're going to yeah. the You're not yeah, it... on the US coast, you're not waiting for a convoy to pass, you're sitting off the port and you're sitting there yeah. going, mm, what's coming? No, and you can't, you, you have to organize the convoys outside of the port. So you have to go past the past the submarines anyway, um, but it is true that there that to an extent that there we were the U.S. and uh, Admiral King were reluctant to adopt even unescorted convoys. In a, um, it's one of the reasons why the British uh, there's a, there are a whole range of different books and there's always a, a bit of a fierce debate over this. So whether or not the British were right in that they kept hunter groups. Uh, anti-submarine hunter groups going in the western approaches for the uh, whole, whole way through the war and they kept going well perhaps they shouldn't have had them perhaps they should have been using these escorts for convoys well the reason you have the hunter groups going in the western approaches is literally because you cannot afford to, for any submarine to think that what they can do is spend their time loitering happily around in the western approaches because that's yeah. the one yeah. area where the convoys have to go through and those hunter groups would often be used to strengthen convoys which they thought were going to get attacked and again, yeah, I, one of the problems with that graph you showed earlier of the Enigma and all these sort of things, um, and if you could go back to that graph, the other point I would... Yes, uh, it will take some time though. <laughs> okay, sorry. I should have said nah, that Nah, no problem. But the whole point of that graph is uh, we always talk about breaking an Enigma as being this thing. Actually, it's not. The biggest thing for the Royal Navy that they used during wartime, because it was often an indicator before they got to that point of breaking Enigma and all these things, was that traffic analysis, i.e. the volume going back as a forwards, because Donitz was a micromanager par excellence. That man was obsessed with micromanaging everything. And he would really try to micromanage his wolf packs, because that was the only way he knew how to get try and coordinate them. And even if you don't track that if they've changed the code or if you're not quite managing to get a full signal, you can tell from the traffic going backwards and forwards, the sheer volume being transmitted, that they are getting must be closing in on a convoy because they're coordinating and all these signals are going back. So, so uh, what they do is they'd watch the simple traffic analysis going in and when it reaches a certain point, they'd send out alert to the convoys to go, one of you is just about to get whacked. And every convoy which was in the closest to the UK in Western Approaches Command, in sort of the closest area, the hunter groups would fold onto that convoy. Yep. And suddenly that convoy would go from having the escort it did have, which was probably enough to get it through the Atlantic, but suddenly a hunter group of Black Swan class or Hunt class destroyers or any, all these things would turn up, position itself around them and go, yeah, come on. You want to come mm. to us? And the thing is, it takes time to get all these things in process. And you also have to consider the volume of trade going backwards and forwards in terms of the kill ratio for the Battle Atlantic. You know, that yeah. has an impact on things. If there's more trade, if there's more submarines out at sea, then there are likely to be more kills. But if there's less, yeah. it's love. 
And this is where those big, basically, maps of what's happening and what we know is happening become very in handy because when you get all this radio traffic in, you get a direction. And so you can kind of triangulate and figure out and narrow down with between rather than your entire group of convoys, there's probably three. So you can send your message to them, them or you can at least organize some sort of help for, for a smaller group if you can organize all this information um, well. And that, well, that developing that ability is um, takes time. Marcus Faulkner's um, atlases of World War One and World War Two have mm -hmm. huge sections about the battles of the Atlantic fought in both of those. And they are really worth looking at. If anyone, uh, they are expensive, but they are worth it. They are sort of like Norman Freeman books. They are the same size as Norman Freeman books. They are expensive, but worth it. And they buy it. I will have to hold my hand up. He is a friend. He was a, 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 a he's a colleague from King's College London. I've worked with him for many years. Marcus Faulkner is amazing, but his books are really, really good. And it, yeah. you know, my old prof Andrew Lambert wrote a foreword in them. And that is, uh, yes, I'm his friend, but I you have to be honest about that as well. They are good. Also, anyone who watches my channel knows I uh, I have a rule. If my friends' books aren't good, I just never mention them. I tell them privately, but never mention it publicly. Yeah. Uh, since we were talking earlier about the air gap uh, in the middle of the Atlantic, not only from the point of view of cover from submarines, but also of cover against the long-range uh, German patrol planes, uh, there were some actually uh, like uh, quite hair-raising uh, solutions to that. I'm uh, putting mm. in the first of them here. Uh, the <laughs> some very catapult. brave hurricane pilots. Some yes, very, very brave hurricane pilots. The catapult armed merchants. I actually uh, did see somewhere a discussion like why they still had to have the uh, undercarriage down for the takeoff. Mm. And that's apparently that uh, having the wheels up was tried, but it changed the aerodynamics so much that the pilots just had trouble getting safely into the air because it was just completely different handling. So they just kept them but mm -hmm. still the principle was you have this ship with a one shot uh, uh, basically one shot catapult on the deck yeah with with a fighter if a german uh, search plane is circling you launch the fighter the pilot tries to shoot down the german plane and then he either lands on water or given the nature of the uh, Atlantic rather bails out and is picked up by a boat. So much for the theory. How often was it actually used in practice? More than any pilot would like. Yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> used, it wasn't used as often as you might think because, for obvious reasons, it was not a, a particularly popular uh, way of going of doing things. And it were the merchant aircraft carrier and early escort carrier programs were in place this was basically a stop gap until they could get those those out to sea but um yeah it was when it was used it was even more taking your life into your own hands than the fact you'd have to ditch into the atlantic or if you were extremely lucky you might have enough fuel to try and make it to a land base um, if you trusted your, your sea navigation skills that much but the thing was everybody knew that if this plane was going to be launched, it was not going to come back. It was an expendable aircraft. And that added an extra little bit of danger to it all because, of course, the RAF isn't going to send brand new fighters fresh out of the factory to be launched on a one-shot mission. So what they tended to get was old aircraft that were basically flight, flight life expired, um, aircraft that were so badly damaged that they could be patched up and they might hold together for half an hour or so but no one could guarantee that they'd hold together if they landed on a normal runway again or they might fly apart after two or three hours of flying basically or two the aircraft or three minutes of flying yeah basically the yeah. aircraft had to be on its absolute last legs for it to yeah. be selected yeah. for, for cam duty which meant that when you were launched you you not only knew that you were probably going to have to spend some time in the north atlantic which is never a pleasant experience but you were also being launched in an aircraft that nobody really was going to miss. <laughs> yeah. And you, you're also compounding that onto um, like all of these aircraft, even if they're older or, or used, they're by the time by the time of the day, they're extreme high performance vehicles mm -hmm. that haven't had maintenance in four weeks, um, and you know aren't aren't being cared for in the same way that you would have it on an airfield. And they're I mean, exposed. To, they're exposed to seawater. Yeah, being stuck <laughs> on the bow of a ship working its way through the Atlantic. Yeah, it's 
uh, it's not exactly a reliable um, reliable source, but it, if it's what you have, it's what you have. Yeah. Uh, it's better and, uh, than nothing, but it's not much better than nothing. Yeah, this is uh, the second step of that uh, equation that was already mentioned, the mm. merchant aircraft carriers, which was exactly what it says on the box. You have a cargo ship, you slap a flight deck on it, and it still carries cargo, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, you, you usually try and carry either, depending on the ship you're converting, but they they prefer to use either tankers or grain ships, basically either mm -hmm. a liquid cargo that you could pump uh, pump out of the ship, regardless of the uh, flat fact that it had a flight deck on it, or in the case of a grain ship or something like that, something with a very small unit cargo, which again could be much more easily maneuvered. Um, in terms of extracting it as compared to carrying something like tanks or jeeps or um, coal or something or lump, lumps of iron which would be much more difficult to extract through or around a flight deck yeah and and after and after you get from these early merchant ships you get into the actual like escort carriers like the bogues hmm. uh, and just just before that here is a, actually a picture from board of one of the uh, merchant aircraft carriers uh, in uh, well uh, North Atlantic weather in winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, yeah, the they flight were, operations. They weren't exactly fun. Yes. No, it's um, yeah. That what once the temperatures got cold enough that the sea water is beginning to freeze, you know you have some rather significant cold problems. Yeah, and here is one of the like uh, proper escort carriers, one of the first ones. But mm -hmm. uh, they were already a huge, huge uh, improvement because they had real flight deck, real hangars, and uh, actually a real, uh, real crew for the aviation operations. So they could put up yeah. reliable so air. Things is, um, one of the first those is, of course, the carrier which um, mine and Drax's favorite pilot from World War Two, Eric Winkle Brown. And his naval flying stripes on really, because he's flying from a escort carrier on the uh, run to actually this is through this at uh, the um, down the coast of through the Bay of Biscay, uh, Biscay down to Gibraltar and sort of that run because that's actually another big part. We often think of the Battle Atlantic, we think of the Atlantic crossing, but it's also the ba uh, Bay of Biscay and mm -hmm. part of the French coast because there's all sort of supplies coming from Africa. And as you saw those kills in that sort of kill map you had earlier, there are kills by submarines all the way down the coast of Africa. Yes. Those are those convoys uh, and ships going past. And I, actually, I mean, the escort carriers actually eventually lost on that on that operation, doing those operations. But that's where he earns his air to air kills, and he does he he really earns his stripes as being considered a very very good pilot because <laughs> of flying from that escort carrier. And that's the things for the Royal Navy. Uh, the escort carriers turn into a real boon, as they do for the US Navy as well, in that you can use them as places to train, start to train up your junior pilots. And they can go there, and you can train potential leaders quite quickly, because they're going to be in leadership positions quite quickly. Yep. Uh, whereas on a bigger carry, you'll have a lot of senior people and a lot of senior... You think about it in wartime. Where do you want to start trusting people with leadership positions? Do you want to trust them with leadership positions when they're on your fleet carrier heading into a major battle? Um, probably not. Let's try them out on an escort carrier, which if they muck up, okay, it's only a, a dozen or so aircraft and a, a few hundred crew. It's not something we want to lose, but if they muck up, it's better they muck up there than on the fleet carrier. And so. It's one of the things in World War II that the Battle Atlantic serves as, in many ways, the cradle for what Britain, man Britain does in the Mediterranean, for what Britain does in the Far East and in the Pacific Fleet, etc. Because of the, the training they can give to relatively junior officers there with the corvettes, with the frigates, with all these sort of junior commands and the escort carriers. Yes. Uh, damn it, now I forgot what I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah about the about the southern uh, route because I mean 
in a sense, it was far riskier than the Central Atlantic crossing in that it was far closer to the submarine bases. So yeah. you have more submarines there because you have submarines joining in. Even the submarines that are heading out to the Atlantic for patrol probably wouldn't uh, resist uh, sending few torpedoes your way if you, if they meet Especially you. Especially the ones coming back uh, after they've had yeah. a bad patrol where they haven't found anything in the North Atlantic. Suddenly coming home, they see a convoy. Yes, we don't have to return home and claim we haven't shot a single torpedo. Yeah, uh, it was also in the range of the planes, so mm. it was uh, actually a favorite uh, hunting ground for the. Uh, oh uh, wait, uh, Prince Bib, can you please turn on the lights? Uh, we have a timed switch here, and apparently it decided that it's late enough to uh, switch them off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, you had uh, you had uh, recon plates, but you were also often in the range of strike planes. <laughs> And uh, it was risky even for the Coastal Command because you were actually in a range of uh, long-range heavy fighters from the air airfields in France. I know that uh, several patrol planes over Briske got into uh, firefights with the, uh, with the German fighters and survived, but uh, many more didn't because it mm -hmm. usually wasn't that, uh, that fair a fight. And this is this is also where they start building a lot of the like really, like I guess famous submarine pens on yes. off the west coast or on the west coast of France, and um, and you get because it's a con it's convenient. There is activity, and um, and it's also the fastest way to get out and to get out to the the more safe areas of the Atlantic for the U boats. And um, also, that's where one of the mo one of the most interesting sort of little sort of deceptions the British ever try out goes on in that they try and con the Germans into believing that they can glide torpedoes into those pens. Oh. <laughs> because they try and use the legacy of Taranto and they try and sort of do us all sorts of dissemination and various things with their, you know, es the espionage and the counter espionage and it's well known fact that Britain had basically taken control of the German espionage ring, which didn't exist in the UK because they basically had someone transmitting false information most of the war and capturing agents and turning them. And they used this to try and give the uh, Germans the idea that the British could glide torpedoes so in, in, into the water and get them going before the pens. And this caused the Germans to get very, very worried about the security of their various pens. And they it, it, it yeah. caused fun in their construction. Not only were they adding on concrete on the top, they're also worrying about what the British could do at the entrances, and they started trying to figure yeah. out various things to defend the entrances. Yeah, I, be I believe the Britain was playing a lot of mind games in uh, in there. <laughs> uh, most including... of all, too, is Britain working out how can we screw with their mind? Excuse the French yeah. there. How can we uh, really uh, mind them Yeah, up? Oh, one that uh, like uh, that sounds really scary to me was uh, one of the British uh, propaganda broadcast stations that uh, the Germans knew was a propaganda broadcast station. Uh, sending out uh, music, uh, like uh, uh, music for good luck to the submarines that were going on patrol because they had information from various sources which submarines are actually leaving on patrol. So you sneak out of your submarine pen under the cover of the night so that you are not spotted. Then you uh, surface to recharge, and uh, then hey, you are on on the air. That's like yeah. Hello, we hear you. We know you're there. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that, that, it, 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 it's it's fun times. Uh, sort of. I, th I think uh, it's the the time honored. You have, British. The Brit the, you have to remember. Sorry, the British during World War Two managed to actually, for propaganda reasons, develop the idea of the SAS, and then sit there and go, actually, that could be a good idea. Let's actually build that force. Yeah, it's the the or uh, for the English in general, it's the um like the time honored tradition of just messing with your opponent's minds. Um, the America, America likes to come up with the acronyms. <laughs> like America likes to come up with the acronyms for everything in the military, and uh, Britain likes messing with everybody's mind. Um, it's like you can go through through the ages and find examples. Yeah, we did a whole mind game on the podium, yeah. which at some point World of Warships, which probably cover an armchair ambles, just as a sort of legacy things pre the uh, pre World of Warships period, but. The yeah, ma man. random mind games that the Royal Navy has played on its opponents over the years, and other navies have played, because the Italians played some doozies on the French. Basically, in Europe, most of it is everyone playing mind games on the French and the French falling for it. <laughs> because I think the French are just too trusting as a nation. They're far too nice. 
They actually believe what they're being told by their opponents. Uh, but uh, since we got to the escort carriers, uh, it was again, it was usually a confluence of factors. So at the same time, the escort carriers were coming into their own. There were actually new weapon systems designed. The Hedgehog for the British and the, what was the American rocket system called? Mousetrap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically mm -hmm. both had the same, uh, both looked very uh, in a very similar fashion and both had the same uh, thing that basically with the uh, ASDIC, if a escort ship is going after submarine, it loses contact when it passes over the submarine. Yeah, so which gives... Light, lights again. Yeah. Sorry. With depth charges, if you've got, you're got doing ASDIC, then at least one ship needs to maintain lock while another ship goes over it with depth charges. Probably two go over it with depth charges with a pattern to try and get it, because depth charges are a shotgun scatter system more than a precise aim and take it out. Uh, whereas, because those ships won't have lock while they're dropping their depth charges, so you've got to try and make as wide a field as possible. And this, of course, ties up three ships to engage a submarine. Two to three ships have to go and engage a submarine, which reduces your, about to, uh, your ability to kill it. When, you, you, a, when you've got ASDIC, sonar as the Americans call it, in service, and you've got a lock, and you've got an actual idea, especially with the later and more evolved versions of these ASDIC and sonar, you get an idea of the depth. If you've got Hedgehog, or um, the American one, you can just fire from your ship while maintaining lock, you can point your ship far and take it out. And that means one ship to one submarine, which multiplies the number of submarines your escorts can deal with tremendously. Because it goes from being, okay, we can deal with the number of submarines equivalent to the number of our escorts divided by two or by three, depending on what type of escorts you're dealing with, to, okay, uh, well, as many submarines as we have escorts, we can theoretically manage to deal with. Yes, uh, and bear in mind that it was in a situation when still a lot of escorts had only three or four escort warships. That's like, you mm. just, uh, as an escort commander, you cannot uh, afford to like send three of your ships gallivanting after one submarine and leaving the convoy unprotected, right? That's No, really you pretty much you send two and the other two stay there and you hope another submarine yeah. doesn't turn up. You hope yep. that the submarine you're taking out is the tattletale to try and tell everyone else where you are. The one thing you've got to remember, though, with Hedgehog is, as you can see, you know, I mean, they're pretty big mortar rounds, um, but at the same time, submarines are pretty strong. So whereas a depth charge, which is bigger still, um, yep. can kill or damage a submarine from a near miss, um, see any number of submarine movies for that, um, with Hedgehog the rounds are not powerful enough to damage or destroy a submarine from a near miss. They need to have a direct hit, which is why, amongst other things, they've got that uh, contact fuse firing pin on the on the nose. So you would launch a spread of these, um, usually in a, uh, in a circle, and obviously using the greater accuracy that you have because you've locked onto the submarine with, with your ASDIC, and they would then sink down, and the idea was that at least one, hopefully more of these, would come into direct contact with the hull of the submarine and explode, and that would punch a hole in the sub, and thus allow it to, 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 to kill the sub. The disadvantage, of course, was that if your aim was off by as much as maybe even as much as 10, 15 yards, you could launch a perfect hedgehog pattern, and if, the, say, the, the furthest hedgehog mortar round, it could drift two, three feet past the hull of the sub you're off by just that little bit it's still not going to do anything to the sub other than potentially scare it a little bit now later on in the war they would try and mitigate this by developing a, a further development on a hedgehog called squid um, mm -hmm. which tried to marry the best features of depth charges and hedgehog by basically having an ahead throwing launcher but with a much a uh, fewer number of charges but much bigger charges and then that would later be replaced right at the very end of the war with a system called limbo which was similar but even bigger charges so you're down to three charges per launcher and they usually would try and have two launchers so maximum of six individually launched charges but they were then big enough to replicate the effect of depth charges in that you know you didn't need it you no longer needed a direct hit to kill anything um, and there were various um 
throwers for depth charges as well that were available they're called k guns yeah. and y guns but mm -hmm. they were generally used for side launching depth charges and the like because the one disadvantage of a full-on depth charge at least until you got something like a squid or limbo launcher which could launch things further was that if you I mean, if you're traveling towards the sub and you launch a charge ahead of you you're going to be fairly close to that charge when it goes off and you know you just have to look at any picture of uh a depth charge going off to realize why you don't necessarily want that yeah, going off near one actually you. we had a very illustrative picture yeah. sometime before this let's see uh, ah yeah here mm -hmm. so yeah. this uh, this is a warship dropping a depth charge mm -hmm. and just uh, to give That's full uh, full uh, like illustration of the size of the explosion that warship is not a destroyer it's a light cruiser mm. old one but still it's a light cruiser so a ship quite bigger than a destroyer and you can see that the, uh, the is explosion that a Brazilian is Brazilian light cruiser in picture yes talking about it. yes i thought it was yeah so basically you don't want to sell your ship over this and there were cases of uh, escort ships being damaged by their own depth charges yep. uh, because well if uh, if the submarine was in a shallow depth, then well, you have to set the you have to set the gauge to uh, shallow depth, and uh, then you get a yeah. bit too close and to the to the explosion for comfort. Yeah, yeah. So which this leads into the engineering problem of depth charges and sonar, which or or Aztec, which is that if you have to launch your depth charges behind you, your target has to be behind you or about to be behind you. And that's where you can't hear because your engines are behind your sonar. Or rather, the noise Which from your engine. Why it requires multiple ships to do, do an accurate yeah. uh, Aztec guided depth charge assault. You need a second mm -hmm. one. And they, at so, the beginning of the war, they have to try, they're trying to do it one on one. And eventually, they, you know, they realize this is one of the interesting things. Okay. At the beginning of World War II, they know you, this is the problem. And they know you need to do this. They just don't have enough ships available. Yep. The thing is, they've done exercises. They know they need multiple ships. It, it's one of those things like multi-carrier tactics. If you consider the U.S. Navy, the Royal Navy, they both had doctrines and had exercises in the interwar period where they had developed and used multi-carrier forces and multi-carrier task forces. They were something they were really keen on the idea of. It's just when war happened, they had a far bigger war, and they didn't have enough carriers to actually be able to grip them together for a multi-carrier war. Because they weren't fighting just the Japanese, or just the Italians, or just the Germans. Or, you know, they were fighting both. And to cover the whole Atlantic against the theoretical threat of German surface raiders, and, well, the actual threat of German surface raiders and German submarines, requires a lot of carriers. And provide the carriers also to support the operations against the Italians when they have a lot of land-based air support, that provides uh, requires a lot of carriers. And the Royal Navy only has a certain number of carriers. And of those, let's be honest, one of them is Argus. Another one is yes. Eagle. And another one is Hermes. And that's before we get on to Furious, Cour Courageous, and Glorious. Uh, they're all interesting, and most of them are legacies of World War I. There's Ark Royal, and there's the Illustrious class, which are coming into service. But they're delayed, because... Winston Churchill makes the decision that carriers are capital ships, and so when he orders the capital ships to be delayed to focus on escort, on escort production, he also orders, against the advice of his admirals, the carriers to be delayed as well, because carriers are capital ships, and the admirals are going, but we use them for anti-submarine warfare, which is why Courageous is used and is lost when she is lost, to carrying out anti-submarine warfare operations, because carriers are part of the British anti-submarine warfare doctrine. They've worked in the 1920s and 30s because they realize aircraft are very useful. But he decides to delay them, and that's what causes quite a lot of trouble and eventually ends up with Force Z. And the issue with them not having a carrier is because for the Battle Atlantic, because the car escorts have been ordered, but they're not being built fast enough because they've been ordered with the idea that war was going to be not until 1942 or later, the capital ships are, sl are stopped to try and focus and churn out as many of the escorts as possible. And this includes the carriers. And so the Battle Atlantic has big knock-on effects, not even, even beyond its own fighting, beyond uh, on the rest of the World War II, because of some of the decisions made in its name. Yeah. That's... Uh, 
Yeah, it, it's, it's like everything has a terrible knock-on effect and terrible effect on uh, lead times here. That's uh, yeah. there uh, is no. Sometimes there is no good decision to make. That's yeah. one of the fallacies of war. People think there's a right and a wrong answer. Sometimes yeah. li there is literally just a less wrong answer. Yeah, and even and, then, sometimes uh, you get the wrong one. Yeah, and uh, again, speaking of the knock-off effects, here's another uh, thing, another picture that uh, okay, Toby Jack comments that uh, Black, Sw uh, Black Swan class. Uh, most successful anti sub class uh, ship of World War II. Uh, but uh, that's actually not why I put it in there, even though Black Swans definitely were useful. They served as a, a basis for the River class uh, frigates as well. It's basically, uh, as, as far as I was able to uh, see, the River class was basically give us Black Swan, but so that it could be built like a Corvette. So, like. Uh... Actually, the River class are based on the class which the Black Swan is based on ah okay so there, there was a common ancestor there yeah there, basically there's a common ancestor and uh, i did a whole video about this and but uh, basically what happens if they have this, uh, this great idea and that common ancestor its hull gets used for the hunt class destroyers its hull gets mm -hmm. used for the black swan class uh, the hunt class destroyer escorts escort destroyers the uh black swan class sloops and also its requirements and the things which based it were funneled into right then we need a commercial hull which can be basically a commercial hull that can be designed to fit this and originally they were calling sloop uh, they were call, uh, coming up with all sorts of ideas for what to call frigates including single screwed sloops um they had all sorts of ideas about it and that's where they come from so they have a sort of common ancestor not, uh, not uh, the black swans are one of the developments of that ancestor. okay yeah uh, but uh, the main thing why I chose this picture is, uh, and I'm afraid that on the stream in the resolution it won't be visible really, but uh, there is a very weird antenna on the top of the mast, which mm -hmm. is another big thing that basically came in uh, 1942 and then uh, uh, came to fruition in 1943 when there were in, uh, already enough ships to actually use that to its full potential. And that's the uh, actually thing that uh, Germany learned too late about because uh, they were uh, keeping operational safety of their spies, as far as, as I know. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe they got a picture of uh, HFDF antenna quite early on after it was uh, deployed, but since it was uh, taken from a secret uh, post in Gibraltar, they had to censor out the location and the Gibraltar rock before passing the picture to people who uh, could actually analyze the picture mm -hmm. and uh, they managed to delete the antenna during this uh, undertaking so <laughs> so what does this antenna exactly do uh well it's uh the name of the system was hfdf or high frequency direction finder and it basically tells you uh when someone is talking when someone is transmitting you don't need to actually read what he is talking about to know he's somewhere out there and if you are in the middle of the atlantic and someone is talking right next to you chances are it's not a friendly submarine there and, and the idea so is that they have them to pretty much every ship they had going and have been yeah. plan doing this for a, a while they've been uh, the, it's one of the interesting things the british were using a variation on this system in the 1930s from their cruisers to monitor the japanese in the far east and basically their cruisers were going around listening into Japanese radio transmissions and recording them and then they were brought back to the UK and uh, <clears throat> analysed, let's say, to try and work out what the Japanese were up to. So the it, it, it's a useful system. The idea is if you... Because obviously with, with just the one ship, that just tells you a bearing. So it's like, okay, well, we know somewhere down this bearing there is a hostile ship or someone talking who shouldn't be there at the very least. The problem with that, of course, is it could be a mile away it could be 10 miles away it could be 100 miles away you might get some inclination of exact of roughly how far away they were based on the strength of the signal but you can't tell for certain the i the reason um, why tucky mentioned specifically you need a lot of them is because you have to have multiple bearings so you can have mm -hmm. some really big antennas which are deployed in the uk uh, which are also used for this purpose but obviously out at sea you can pick up weaker signals that are much closer to the convoy and so if you have multiple ships fitted with this then if say this vessel says right well i've got a, a bearing of zero nine zero um i.e directly east 
and a ship that's 10 miles further south says, yeah, well, my bearing is 087, and a ship that's 10 miles further north says, well, my bearing is 092, then you can take a map and you can draw from the various positions of the ships, you can draw all those bearings, and where those bearings overlap, that gives you a near, near enough exact fix on where that signal is coming from. Um, initially, when you're sort of still in the early to mid part of the war, that can allow you to send a ship forward to try and deal with it, but obviously that takes time and a ship can be spotted. And then as you get to the mid and late part of the war, uh, it, you would use that signal to then send an aircraft from an escort carrier or similar to go and try and deal with it, which is obviously a lot, qu a lot quicker. And sometimes <laughs> if they're feeling really cruel, they'd use they'd have uh, they'd have swordfish etc airborne anyway as scouting forward, and the swordfish which was forward of the convoy would get told, "Hang on, there's a submarine between you and the convoy," and so the submarine would be sort of watching the direction it thinks the convoy is going to come from, and the swordfish would come from behind it, and that was okay. Yes, the swordfish is not exactly the fastest aircraft in the world. But it's still an aircraft, and if they dive down from, if they have some moderate high high, high, uh, high cloud cover that they can use, that they can then swoop in, and then the poor submarine can get hit before it has a chance to dive, because that is yeah, the submarine's yeah. best way to get around. I know the Germans do produce these lovely flak submarines and various other things who have the idea of ambushing um, British aircraft and American Allied aircraft in World War Two, but they don't really do that well. I think one of them, if you. Again, earlier you were showing a picture of what's called a flying porcupine, uh, a, a Sunderland. Yes. And, uh, and yeah, one of those flak submarines had an interesting time with Sunderland. It was a case of, we've got some guns. Yeah, we've got a lot more on the Sunderland than you have. <laughs> do you really want to duke it out with us? Uh, um, the submarine didn't do that well. The, that thing was just literally a festooned. It was a flying arsenal. It had guns everywhere, machine guns, everything that we fitted, and then depth charges. And it had actually a depth charge system on the wings that you could just sort of, they would be loading the depth charges up and rolling them out and dropping them. And it's just, yeah. it's not something you want to tangle with in if you're a 1940 submarine. Yeah. And one of the, we have mentioned that the swordfish is a, like relatively slow um, and and is always touted as this out of date aircraft. But one of the key advantages is that a, a swordfish is small, but it has a very long loiter time. Mm -hmm. So you can keep it in the air and you can keep it in the air for an hour or two at a time, uh, which is longer than almost any other carrier borne airplane in the early part of the war can really go. And it's um, also very easy to maintain and keep going. Yes. Yep. Which was the whole point. Again, I, I think I've said this in so many videos now, it's, I'm starting to sound like I'm repeating myself. But <laughs> it's the do uh, it, na na it's something which works for the Royal Navy wouldn't necessarily work for the US Navy in their plans at the beginning of World War II. And in 1939, what was Britain thinking about potentially fighting a war in the Far East against the Japanese? The other end from its infrastructure line, as it did in the uh, 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 as its nation was. So it had the swordfish in service, which was the flower of early 1930s technology. It was also developing the albacore, and it was also developing the um, barracuda. And the albacore was coming into service, and the barracuda was supposed to be the albacore's successor. So this is its plan in 1939. It has a nice logical progression going on. Wonderful. But uh, it's not wonderful, let's be honest. The Abacor's atrocious and the Barracuda is even more weird. But we'll leave that to one side. The thing about the Swordfish was it was designed at a time when they were really obsessed with having aircraft still available on D plus 5, D plus 6 of any war and any battle. And the idea was you needed something which could basically be maintained on a shoe string or, in the case of a Swordfish, a, a, a bra underwire occasionally. There are some quite yeah. famous stories of them being repaired with those things. It's quite disturbing. Um, so they have the, the swordfish is very, very able to, very, very easy to maintain by comparative aircraft standards, which is another advantage for escort carriers and another reason the swordfish spends so long in service during World War Two. Because if you're on an escort carrier, which is not exactly the largest thing in the world, and you want to keep a viable air group going in the North Atlantic. Your swordfish is good enough to take out submarines. It has a long loiter time. It can carry a huge amount of ordnance for its size, and it's very easy to maintain and fly. So every time people turn around to me and go, "Why did the British have a swordfish in service for so long?" I go, "Well, 
If you have an aircraft like that and you're fighting the Battle Atlantic, why wouldn't you keep it in service? Yes, uh, exactly. And uh, I mean, apart from the Swordfishes and the Sunderlands and uh, better stuff that is coming now, uh, in the next pictures, uh, there were also already in the earlier stages of the wars, the coastal commands did uh, the coastal command did uh, some stunts like staging uh, Wellingtons with extra fuel tanks from Ireland for basically one-off uh, trip to a convoy or two. But uh, basically, uh, the intent was just to rattle any submarines that might be encountered because. If uh, you are in the middle of the Atlantic Gap and you don't expect uh, any aircraft to turn up, when one does turn up, it's a surprise, definitely. And uh, even if uh, you probably will survive that encounter, it's actually even better if you survive that encounter, because then uh, you can tell other submarine crews that, uh, hey, there was a plane there. And of course, uh, if other submarines don't come back, then the Germans start thinking, hang on, these planes must be taking out submarines. They become a reason that submarines are being lost. Yes. And there are a lot of submarines lost without any knowledge of what happened and how they disappeared. And yeah. if you're German, your pres presumption, like assumption, is probably going to be based on probability. Uh, the you know the probabilities, it's enemy action. And if you've got a report, come back of these aircraft, these massive, uh, these bombers that are supposed to not be out there were out there. Uh, then you suddenly start thinking, well, they must have these aircraft, and there must be lots of them. And how many do you need to do this level of patrolling? Keep it up. Well, it must be about 40 or 60. And you read some very interesting German intelligence estimates of what the British have assigned to various groups. And there's an entire air wing, which Coastal Command apparently had, which I've never found any record of the British of that wing actually existing. So... The Germans seem to think the the only way this works is they have another wing, they have another air group which they're not talking about, and yep. so they look at the numbers and they decide, well, hang on, the they have this air group, this air group, and then it skips a number, and then they have another air group. So that air group must actually exist. Yes, Proof, uh, you know the idea that the British actually were going to be logical in their numbering of their air group. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, the Germans initially were logical in the numbering before they found out that it makes it a bit too easy to guess uh, the real number of divisions so, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, air groups and uh, other uh, units. Uh, in any case, at the same time that the HFDF is coming, the hedgehogs are coming, the escort carriers are coming, uh, there is also like uh, newer planes coming into the Coastal Command, which was initially getting kind of rejects, like, well, not rejects, but planes that uh, uh, were not satisfactory to go over the Reich. So uh, Vickers Wellington, when it started to get long in, uh, in the teeth before that, they were getting uh, Hamptons, they were having the Sunderlands, which were awesome planes for the purpose, but uh, there weren't You couldn't build them, them enough. The Sunderlands were just yes. too difficult to build. They are a very yeah. complicated design to construct. You, you can't mass produce them. Yeah. No. But uh, then uh, uh, Uncle Sam started uh, producing uh, these, the Catalina cat uh, Cataclysm, right? Yeah, the, <laughs> the Catalina is we one of the unsung heroes of World War II in yeah. general. And Apparently there's a whole church of the Cataclysmic Catalina now set up on my <laughs> YouTube channel, so, you know. Well, uh, better than Blackburn, Blackburn, at least Catalinas look nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, You're going to uh, start a war on my channel now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, they were, I mean, they were slow, but they had a long range and uh, also were quite nicely armed. And then there was the uh, Consolidated uh, Liberator, the mm -hmm. initially mm -hmm. LB-30, later B-24. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually was surprised to find that uh, five uh, prototype Liberators took part in the Battle of Midway on the... Sec uh, on the third day when uh, General Tinker led them to try to catch the retreating Japanese fleet and uh, he and his plane vanished uh, under, well, probably due to some uh, technical difficulties on the way back. Uh, but in any case, the Liberators uh, were uh, rather long ranged, especially once the Coastal Command had their say in it. Mm -hmm. And they could carry a massive load of ordnance and all the bells and whistles, they could uh, basically 
The older planes had uh, obviously the problem if they would carry radar, radars were still heavy bul bulky, they would reduce the performance, they would re increase the fuel consumption, the same with, uh, with weapons. The Liberators could mm -hmm. carry basically it all without really noticing that much. And uh, on top uh, of radar... On top of a fight with another talismanic force, because if you consider it, the Germans, for them, it's having 300 submarines. For the Royal Air Force, it's having a thousand bombers. They want to launch a thousand bomber raid. Yeah. They're sure that if they launch a thousand bomber raid on a German city, they will cause so much damage, it will drive Germany from the war. They will realise they have no chance. If they just launch a thousand bomber raid, they end up launching about a dozen of them. It doesn't really work. But they, they, they're really obsessed with the idea, and there's a huge fight over whether or not the Coastal Command should get these aircraft or Bomber Command. Because Coastal Bomber Command's going, but this will help us reach our thousand bomber raid. And Coastal Commander going, yes, but this will help us get the spare parts which allow you to actually operate a thousand bomber raid. <laughs> and it's a huge, it's a, a whole fight. Eventually Churchill has to get involved and does sort of basically goes, no, Coastal Command can have them. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things with American uh, bomber aircraft in general is that you know very early on they recognize the, the Coastal Defense Act aspect of aircraft and the most of the uh, B-17 development um, came in with the idea of using it as a coastal reconnaissance and re coastal defense aircraft because the, there was this grandiose idea that you could actually level bomb and, and actually hit a ship with with a bomb from a, a, a horizontally brought, dropped bomb. But um, so a, a lot of this development that's been going on over the, through the late 1930s of the B-17 program gets can carried on into the later bombers so that they have the ability to have exceptionally long range, long loiter times, um, but are also fast enough to get where they need to go. Yeah. And the yeah, advent uh, of intermetric radar helps a lot. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, it means you can spot periscopes rather than subs. And then there was this, which uh, someone in the chat um, uh, tipped that uh, it's a radar. This actually is not a radar. This is another quite ingenious solution because with radar, you had a kind of similar problem to the ASDIC. You cannot really use it to fire control and uh, it had some minimal range. So if you are closing on the submarine, then right at about the distance where you should start uh, aiming your weapons, the radar is of no use anymore. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Especially if it's, I mean, if it's in daylight, it's easy. But if it's at night, which is when the submarines are on the surface and uh, more vulnerable and stuff, it's dark. Unless you mount a huge ass uh, searchlight or rather floodlight on the wing of your plane. And then just as you get to the radar minimal distance, you turn on the light oh. and submarine and you also Plus, blind the gunners you can yes, exactly it's, it's daylight called, ah! it's called the lay light and it was tied into the radar which is i said this is where the centimetric radar really helps out because you can spot small parts of a u-boat on the surface even like a snorkeling u-boat rather than just looking for the entire sub and um, some of the aircraft that are equipped with it actually got quite inventive with it because obviously you could yeah, you as like I said, you fly in, you'd use your radar to guide where the light should look, and then as you began to lose your radar, switch the light on, there's the sub, keep it locked on, drop the weapons. Um, but some of the air, air crew realized that you could get even sneakier with it. So what they would do is, if they identified a sub on the surface or, or snorkeling or whatever with radar, if the cloud cover was low enough or if it was dark enough, um, they would establish a fix on where the sub was by circling, then they'd head in. But as they headed in and dropped altitude to be able to drop rockets or depth charges or whatever, um, they would actually put their engines to idle or in some cases even shut down completely so that you wouldn't even get the, the slight warning of the roar of four large engines. Um, it, they would just glide in effectively um, on, on minimal to no power and so, especially at night, then in ideal circumstances, the first thing the U-boat knew was when a blinding searchlight suddenly switched on and illuminated them, um, at which point then the engines would obviously be kicked back in, roar back up to full power, and there'd suddenly be explosives dropping all around you. 
Yes, and uh, on top of that, uh, I mentioned earlier the American uh, mousetrap, the rocket uh, anti-submarine mortar. That was adopted for aerial use as well. And uh, in, uh, again, quite ingenious way, uh, they figured out that basically one of the problems with the bombing accuracy is that if you drop bombs, they continue flying ahead, so you have to count with that. Uh, so uh, they figure out that with the proper loading of the mousetrap rockets, you can actually mount them backwards. So basically when you fly the proper speed above the submarine and you fire them, they fall straight down. So kind of makes the aiming slightly easier. Uh, a lot yeah. scarier for the submarine to deal with. Yeah. That as well. Uh, this is one of the standard uh, standard book class uh, aircraft carrier escorts, which basically when, once they started flooding Atlantic, it was uh, basically on top of all these measures. That was uh, that was then the spike in the submarine uh, losses. Yeah, and I, then we have uh, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say one one of the other interesting things is one you get su sufficient critical mass of escort carriers, you actually see a return to uh, a type of warfare that actually ended up with a loss of HMS Courageous back in the early part of the war because it wasn't viable then but it was viable now and that's the hunter killer groups because back when Courageous had been doing it it only had a couple of escorts minimal early ASDIC and just depth charge rails over the back not really much idea about how to conduct aerial anti-submarine warfare either so it was very vulnerable. And the exercises, to... but they were really the trouble is when you do exercises, you can get artificial and no. false positives. But it, it, you do it an done... exercise and test an idea, and you find out the idea works mm. or not, not if that idea is practical. So they, they, so that's why you end up with courageous being lost because there, mm -hmm. there just isn't the uh, degree of coverage around it to stop something just sneaking up on the carrier and sinking it. Whereas by the time you've got plenty of escort carriers out there. Uh, you've got more ships, more escorts with much better sonar, with all these other things like Hedgehog, that, like we've discussed, with radar. The aircraft have radar, and ultimately, worst comes to worst, of escort carriers are a lot more expendable than a fleet carrier anyway. And so, you, by the end, toward the end of the war, you start to get these hunter killer groups centered around an escort carrier with half a dozen escorts, and they would actually using. Uh, HFDF fixes and in and in, uh, signal intercepts from decoded Enigma transmissions and such like, they'd actually go after submarines away from the convoys. So if they knew the submarines were congregating somewhere or in transit somewhere, if they had any kind of location fix, they'd actually go and try and actively hunt them down before they could get anywhere near the merchant ships, which was another thing that helped drop the losses for, for the merchants. Yeah, uh, that's uh, actually, I now skipped to one, uh, another image, uh, another job of the Coastal Command craft was actually, and uh, one often overlooked part of the whole Battle of Atlantic, uh, was uh, hunting for German, uh, well, the merchant cruisers, but also uh, supply ships for submarines, which mm -hmm. at least at the, in the beginning of war were extending the submarine operations uh, somewhat, and uh, blockade runners carrying vital cargo and that ties to a question from Ching Chingish Cook, I guess uh, whether there was any concerted effort by the Kriegsmarine to use U-boats, U-boat packs to drive the British blockading warships away from uh, various locations that the raiders were in so that they could put to sea but I would say that's like basically in the early war there were no wolf packs and uh, the Royal Navy was conducting basically a distant blockade with the warships, so there was nothing to try to attack much for the U-boats in this sense. And by the time this picture was taken, which is a break from 1943 to 1944, it was kind of too late, too late for anything like that, because uh, this was actually part of uh, Operation Stonewall, which uh, I believe was a kind of a, a warship sweep of the Biscay to maintain the blockade and that did not end up well for the Germany that's yeah uh, this is a this picture is a, a blockade runner runner Alsterufer, which was uh, basically the the blockade runner was found by coastal command uh, liberators set on fire later sunk 
the relief force, uh, the relief surface force that was sent to uh, escort it back uh, was pounced on by two British light cruisers and uh, kind of uh, demolished. And basically by this time, the Sea of Biscay was kind of... Uh, British Lake, kind of, because uh, it was hostile territory for yes. anyone else. Yeah. Because it was hostile uh, territory. Yeah, the the submarines to get in position to attack this uh, blockading force, they would have to get close to it, and that would be risky. Because uh, don't forget that submarines spent most of the time on surface, and yeah. on surface with planes overhead with destroyers on the prowl. That's not a good like uh, good policy to ensure long life. Even with the snorkels and stuff, it's uh, and uh, and the end effect on the war would be small because let let's be cynical here. The allies could afford to lose several destroyers as long as uh, they don't lose uh, uh, several cargo ships. So it, that's yeah, a extent. kind of yeah to an extent of course, yeah. but. That's one of the reasons why whenever we sort of, I know I say this quite a lot again, um, when you're starting to talk about the Battle of Atlantic, I say Norway is a deciding factor in how difficult it is, and the fall of France, yeah. of course, a deciding factor. Because if you had, Nor if Germans had fell, Germany had fell in Norway, and you'd end up with a Norway which was at all pro-British, to an extent, let's say, that the Coastal Command could just fly backwards and forwards from Britain to Norway. Now I know it's not a not, it's not a quick or a short journey, but it's not that massive. But if you could keep a regular flight patrol going backwards across the North Sea between Britain and Norway, you would have made getting submarines into the Atlantic through the North Sea very very difficult because there'd have been a huge trench of ocean that they couldn't have gone on the surface through because the aircraft would have kept going backwards and forwards and they would have been caught. And it's the same with sort of, with, and with, to the extent it's less so with the Battle of the France because submarines going through the channel, yes, they they can do it, but it's it's never a good, really good idea because there's a lot of minefields by both sides there, and there's a lot of coastal forces from both sides there who both get trigger happy, and there are several instances of German submarines whenever they do try actually running into as much trouble with their own Ger with, uh, with German coastal forces as with British coastal forces in the channel because both sides could end up attacking them, because the British coastal forces would would believe, well, we have no submarines here, so you must be an enemy. And the Germans were never sure if the British didn't have submarines, or, uh, had submarines there or not, so they would attack them, because if you see a submarine, you attack first. Yep. Uh, I had an interesting question about the... Oh yeah, uh, here, interesting uh, what if from uh, Lannister, because I mean we are shortly running out of time, so I'll quickly run through the very interesting questions. How would the Akron and the Macon, the US Navy rigid airships equipped with airplanes, affect convoy protection? Uh, the airships that got wrecked back in 1930s with the parasites uh, planes. I mean, it's a very steampunky idea. <laughs> That's sort uh, of escort carrier. Definitely would be an improvement over a Mac ship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be more viable than a Mac ship, but you know, it's sort of escort carrier role. Yeah, you you would have basically had a flying escort carrier, and it, it would have had well, it would have had two advantages over a conventional escort carrier. One, you can't torpedo it because it's up in the skies, um, and two, it in and of itself is an excellent observation platform. Because it's yeah. going to be looking out over the convoy from a high altitude anyway, um, regardless of what its its aircraft uh, do. Obviously, you know the, the the reason they crashed was they weren't particularly brilliant handling in rough weather, and the North Atlantic is you know known for having some rough weather. Mm -hmm. So they either probably would have been lost in operational accidents, maybe gone down in some kind of massive blaze of glory dogfight with an FW-200 Condor, which would have been a very interesting thing to watch. Um, or they would have just operated on uh, restricted routes as and when the Allies knew that the weather was going to be good enough for their operation. But the, to be honest, the simple fact that they, if, if they had survived, that they would have existed at the beginning of the war, or at least at the beginning of the US involvement in the war, would have meant you would have had an instant ability to deploy aircraft in some circumstances over convoys, which in and of itself would have been 
uh, a fairly significant upgrade on over what they had at the, in you know the actual timeline. And there's always uh, a possibility that if they've been around for long enough, they'd have actually up-engined them, which might have helped out with the handling in rock weather issues. Because yeah, if they given them more horsepower, they might have been... There is a, the, 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 it's an open debate. I have to admit, there's, uh, there's a couple of papers I've read which are... I would call them in the sort of semi-academic paper sphere, and that they're, they're uh, engineers who dabble in history, writing this one. And there's a whole sort of debate going on and, uh, uh, in the airship histories. Basically, as to whether or not if they'd been up engine, they would have been better handling, and could have been therefore been more useful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to to me, the, their biggest uh, uh, like benefit would probably have been uh, the escorts along the eastern seaboard rather than the deep Atlantic. But uh, on the other hand, their parasitic planes were uh, basically fighters, so they would need to be uh, modified a lot to be able to. A fighter can Drop. cause a submarine a lot of troubles if it comes in. Yes, it can. If it's got some cannon and it's got a couple of bombs, that's still going to cause a submarine to die. Yeah, you're looking. Because you're looking at can, uh, even a, a 30, 20 millimeter cannon can, but if fired at the right range and hitting the right points, can cause trouble with your hull. I mean, you got to keep in mind this is going to be the this is going to be the U.S. Navy following the uh, the Holy Trinity of Browning 50 caliber. Um, yeah, but um, the the Akron and the Macon were designed for the F9C Sparrowhawk, if I remember right. Or rather, the Sparrowhawk yeah. was designed for them, yeah. um, which is roughly half the weight of a swordfish. Um, so you're looking at a fairly, um, uh, like a very small light air aircraft, but you might be able to take, um, take or reduce your complement to get a couple swordfish in there. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, at least uh, launching from the airship, you don't have trouble with the takeoff with the weight, right? Yep. You, you just drop it in speed. You just have to be able to carry the thing and, and <laughs> drop it. Uh, I have here another interesting question from Wolfsbett Post. What roles did Allied submarines play during the Battle of Atlantic? Were there any notable and interesting success stories? Um, by and large, Allied submarines stayed out of the Battle of the Atlantic on the basis that um, well, you're mostly trying to hunt submarines, and there's precious little way of telling who exactly a submarine belongs to in the immediate contact phase. Um, and the last thing you want to do is find that you've killed one of your own subs. And to be honest, what on earth is a friendly sub going to be doing in the Atlantic anyway? They can't keep up with the convoys. Um, there are loosely within the auspices of the Battle of the Atlantic, there are some submarine operations, but they mainly evolve early on before they can get air cover over the Bay of Biscay. Submarines occasionally either keeping an eye on uh, French Atlantic ports or trying to hunt U-boats on the surface as the U-boats proceed across the Bay of Biscay. There's a few successes there, but nothing much of note. Um, and again, slightly tangentially related to the Battle of the Atlantic, but still technically part of it, there's a lot more um, Allied submarine operations in the North Sea aimed at the same thing. So submarines are leaving or coming back uh, to Germany. They're in that environment, where obviously coordination can be much more readily and quickly established with mainland Britain, there, there are submarines that are in operation, again, trying to either spot or hunt various German submarines. And it's in that operational environment you actually get the, so far, only underwater, fully underwater submarine kill. There are a number of kills where um, submerged submarines kill surfaced submarines, or surface submarines kill surface submarines. But it's in, it's in the North Sea under the auspices of this kind of operation that you get the only um, kill where both submarines are actually submerged uh, which is uh, one, one of the Royal Navy submarines manages to get a U-boat with a spread um, after having tracked it on partly on the surface and then uh, dived to go after it. It's also where you get the ORP Orzel and various other Polish submarines and etc doing some really really fine work. Uh, there's a lot of free Navy subs which get involved and start working out in the North Sea and taking part in those operations. Of course, the Orsal, of course, does actually get sunk and lost. But um, yeah, uh, there are some really interesting operations for the subs. Mostly, the Allied subs will more often not 
especially in the Bay of Biscay, will be laying minefields as well as a method of trying to stop German submarines, but also in, make German ports more difficult for them to use, German control ports more difficult to use. Yeah. Uh, Dan Friedman, uh, slightly stretching uh, the Battle of Atlantic, but at the start of the Norway campaign, a Polish submarine managed to sink a German troop transport. Uh, yes, exactly. As mentioned, that was the Orzel, I believe. And uh, yes. that was uh, kind of a uh, first warning that the, uh, that the invasion of Norway is underway because the submarine reported that there was a bit too many people on, the, on board of that ship. <laughs> It was not a supply uh, ship, it was not a merchant ship. There was a lot of people yeah. on board that ship. Yeah. So the uh, there was a... It, it takes yeah. a while for that to get through to various levels of command. Yeah. Uh, there was a comment from, uh, or a question from Spike Mall uh, from the pre-selected questions. Uh, I've seen an old British intelligence report from after the war. It stated that the lack of ship tenders slash support craft for the German U-boat fleet was detrimental to the overall effectiveness of the U-boat actions. Uh, had the U-boat uh, been able to rearm refuel at sea in greater capacity instead of having to return to port, would that have been more problematic for Allied shipping? I guess it would have been. It would have been, yes, especially if they could have supported the, uh, the submarines at sea. But remember, they have all the milk cars and all the various sister yeah. ships which they do develop to the submarines they try and develop for this. The trouble is, where do you go? Actually resupplying at sea in the middle of the Atlantic from one submarine to another submarine, that requires some very calm water. And there isn't yeah. a lot of calm water in the North Atlantic. Yeah. The the other and thing where are they mind. where are nice ports you can go and do it in? They're all the other thing to bear in mind is that, that that would only really work in the very earliest parts of um it, of the war. So if you because by the by the time you get into the latter stages of the war there's just going to be too many too many allied ships too many allied aircraft any initially when you have things like the hilfskreuzer um there are support ships out there they support the hilfskreuzer they support the surface raiders and indeed the hilfskreuzer themselves often act as surface uh, resupply vessels for u boats but as the allied uh, presence in the atlantic increases there just isn't the the space for them to operate yeah, uh, even though I think uh, where this could have played a role was uh, basically early after the fall of France when uh, basically the submarines were able to get to the French ports much easier than the, all the support uh, equipment remember that the, the Germans have. But Also remember in the beginning period of the war when they could have been most successful, the Germans did have a lot of torpedo problems. Admittedly they were yes. far quicker at fixing them than the Americans, but that's, you know... Probably because, well, the the very different structures of the Kriegsmarine and the likelihood of um, actually getting shot if you didn't fix the torpedo. Or sent to the Eastern Front. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Might as well be the same thing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in any case, it's already uh, late. We are already slightly over time. Uh, so I guess uh, we managed to scratch the surface. <laughs> Yeah, the Babylon almost... take could be many, many recordings and many, many, many discussions. Yes. You know, there is, there is yeah. a lot of room for people to talk about the Battle Atlantic. Yes, so uh, I think actually because uh, both of you have some excellent videos on the topic, I will be dropping links to them uh, tomorrow into the forum threads uh, pertaining to the stream because, uh, I mean, yeah, it's like we, we could sit here an entire week and uh, we still still won't be done. Yep. <laughs> That's... Uh, uh, so I, I think it's uh, it's time to finish and uh, well basically uh, finishing question just to sum it up uh, what uh, like what uh, for you was the biggest uh, single contributing factor uh, to basically seal uh, seal the deal in the Atlantic. Mm. Uh, who wants to start? I'd say the the single. If I had to pick one individual factor, it's probably got to be Aztec, Aztec dash sonar. Um, without that, almost everything else falls apart because radar, radar, and radar equipped aircraft and ships 
They're great for spotting submarines on the surface, but the submarine, of course, is, can go underwater um, to evade that. And generally speaking, by World War II, they are launching their attacks from underwater with uh, torpedoes, etc., rather than World War I, where they often use their deck guns. And so the ability for Allied ships to be able to detect submarines underwater and then follow them and prosecute them with... Um, depth charges and hedgehogs etc that is probably the single most important technology because without that the submarine would either be invisible when it goes underwater which would be a significant problem maybe they could have used hydrophones but it would have been a much less precise science dr clark the treaty of versailles and this is the simple fact is that in the nicest way germany was left with so little maritime infrastructure they could never win the battle atlantic there was never any chance the british could have outproduced them on their own without their calling in the commonwealth allies etc eventually there would be more escorts than submarines there would always be because it's quicker to build and easier to build an escort a flag class corvette than it is a submarine and you need a lot. You need a good. It takes a lot longer to also to train a submarine crew. It takes a lot longer to get a submarine in service and get it viable than it does a flag class corvette. And the thing is, when in World War Two, you have all the Commonwealth industry, you have all the Empire industry and British industry, push it, maritime industry churning out escorts, and then the Americans come in, and it's just even more churning out escorts. And yes, they're churning out Liberty ships, but they're also churning out Victory ships and park ships and all the other ones which are coming from Canada because there's a huge number of merchant ships built by Canada as well as the ones built by America which is a, another program and all these things it's the maritime industry and the fact is Germany's been left with a very weak man maritime industry thanks to the Treaty of Versailles that's why they can only build two capital ships at a time that's why they cannot churn out submarines at the same at the rate they need this is why they don't have a hundred submarines available or well the 300 submarines they need to have a hundred available when war begins because yes they've got plan z but they can't build plan z at no point uh, this is also the reason why the british aren't as worried about the germans as we might looking back in time think they should be with hindsight in the 1930s because they know what industry the germans have and yes the germans can produce some very high-tech equipment but they can't produce a lot of it. And that's always in the British mindset because of the legacy of the Treaty of Versailles. Yes, thanks, uh, Prince Blip. So I'm going to hedge my bet on um, just the information management. Um, so through, throughout the entirety of the Battle of the Atlantic, you have heroic efforts from ground, from I guess sea level all the way up um, to um, the Rins and um, and the officers, but overall it was the ability for especially Britain, um, but also later on the United States gets more involved as time time progresses. But um, but largely it's just the ability to manage the information, get it to the people that need to know, um, and being able to ha allow people to give get a heads up and get going before um, they have to react to being it um being pursued um as it gives you a gives you a heads up but knowing that there's going to be something to look for on your as ahead of time gives you even more heads up um and so whenever they were successful at managing the information getting it to the right people it saved um saved more than we can really quantify cool uh thank you uh so uh for the uh, final, I, I mean, it's time to say our goodbyes. So this is a great opportunity for uh, for you to plug in your uh, channels and obviously your videos that you want to highlight. And I believe uh, the Dr. Clark has a bet going, so oh. I'm giving the word to him. Oh no! <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, this, I need to find at, which is somewhere around here. Oh, there it is. So. Um, I started a Spreadshirt channel, uh, site because Drac, my good colleague, who's down there, there, yeah, I'm pointing right at the right direction, um, has basically been on at me to have merchandise and have some professionalism of that sort of front going on YouTube for ages. So I started up, I started up some Spreadshirt, 
And um, one of the things on there is a Blackburn Blackburn image and all that. All right, all right. Anyway, my, I showed it to my aunt, the same one who did the thousand subscribers bet a long, long time ago. And she turned around and said, well, I would never be caught dead wearing that. But if you doubled your subscribers by the end of the year, I'll, I'll me and my me and my husband, my uncle, will um, wear Blackburn Blackburn face masks. And I went, well, I have just under six and a half thousand. So that'd be 13,000 subscribers. Yes. So she goes 13,000 subscribers by the 31st of December 2021. And she'll be she and my uncle will be pictured wearing Blackburn Blackburn face masks. So there's very little chance of me actually achieving it. But if anyone does fancy coming over and subscribing to the channel and helping me, that'd be really fun because I'd really like to win this one for the family bragging rights. Okay? Thank you. But I was going to be good. I wasn't going to mention it. Well, I mean, Thank you. Uh, we know that the Church of Blackburn Blackburn wouldn't forgive us if we did not mention it. So. <laughs> I, I think Dan Freeman, who was commenting earlier, has appointed himself the High Priest of the Blackburn oh, no. Blackburn at some point as well. All so glory we can all get to the slightly Blackburn, worried. Blackburn. This, is a, this religion is actually growing and starting to um, codify and organize itself into various hierarchies. There is also a priest of the Cataclysmic Kathleen, I think, going around there somewhere. I think, I'm not sure. I think it might be Carl von Gasberg has decided to call himself that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thanks for this, and uh, Drachenifl, uh, do you have anything you want to plug, any uh, currently running project or stuff? Um, yes, so um, I obviously there's my channel, there's regular videos showing up. Um, the only other thing I would mention at the moment is that that we have, there is, well, not a book that I've written, but I've helped with the re-release of it. Um, if you want to have a look at the excellent uh, Russian and Soviet battleships by Stephen McLaughlin, which has long been out of print and uh, available only but for to scalpers um, who are prepared to pay six to eight hundred dollars a copy, there is a much more reasonably priced copy that will be available courtesy of the U.S. Navy Institute, releasing on the fifteenth of September, and that. Uh, is available on the USNI website and also on Amazon and I think other major digital book retailers. And uh, if you keep an eye on my channel uh, in the upcoming uh, couple of few videos, there'll also be a discount code which they've provided me with, which will get you some money off of the new RRP. <laughs> okay, that's uh, good to know. And uh, I've seen some pictures of the Soviet battleship book. Uh, looks uh, very interesting on very little known topic. So. Uh, I oh, guess. Uh... Well, oh yes. Today's topic. Um, there is actually a book which has just arrived for me to review, which is actually a very good book uh, for this topic, which is um, Total Germany: The Royal Navy's War Against Axis Powers, 1939 to 1945, by David Rag. I'm going to be doing a full review of it, and it's going to will come out on my channel. But it's a good book to get if you haven't got it. So. The cool. Book, yeah. Uh, thanks for the book recommendations. I will also drop them uh, on the on the forum threads for everyone who missed them in the stream. Yeah, I won't and, show uh, obviously, the box I bring with me. Uh, and obviously very soon we have also the Tribals, Battles and Darings coming, which we mentioned uh, time and again, so it's getting close. <laughs> it is getting close. Uh, Everything, it's printing as we speak. The factory is yeah. churning around and printing it out. <laughs> Great. Uh, I got so yeah, a picture of it of it going <laughs> through the machine, and I was going, "Thank you." When can I have a copy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for coming by. Thanks for the chat. I hope we managed to ask a lot of questions and talk about a, a lot of topics. I know that we didn't manage to answer nearly all of the questions that uh, that were submitted, but uh, uh, maybe we will try to drop some in the threads uh, later on. And yeah. Uh, thanks for coming by, and I guess see you in about a month. Uh, same way we had to move this to September 6th, we will probably have to move the September edition to early October, because I will be uh, somewhere with very bad connection, uh, so I uh, can't really uh, run stream from there. But uh, uh, on top of that, if anyone was, if anyone is uh, interested in visiting HMS Belfast, we have an event running there. Go to our portal, uh, check it, and uh, 
uh, you can either sign up for, uh, for the VIP tour uh, with a like, guided tour for the ship, or you can just visit London and uh, use the discount for the normal uh, tickets to get on the ship, uh, uh, look over it. It's a very impressive ship, and uh, you might meet Mr. Conway and uh, throw a plushy torpedo at him or something. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you gentlemen, and see you around, and... Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. And uh, thank uh, to all of you who uh, tuned in, who watched, and who provided comments uh, and questions in the stream. Uh, see you around uh, probably earlier than the, the next Armchair Admirals. Uh, I will be uh, appearing in the normal Warship streams uh, for sure. And uh, you will be able to see Prince Blip in the console uh, ship stream, yep. which is the nearest topic of your console historical overview. So for um, the console, or in the in terms of history streams, we have on September 24th, off the top of my head, it will be a Friday in a couple of weeks, we will be covering, uh, I guess, part two of the United States Navy cruisers. Um, and this is going to be covering mostly the wartime um, builds and the very end of um, U.S. cruiser development, not counting the long beaches. Um, and so we're going to be talking about such ships as like the Des Moines and the Wor uh, Worcester. Um, and I'm going into a little bit more details on like what's a little bit different about some of these ships. So, so yeah, thank you for watching and... Have a great time. Bye-bye and enjoy your evening. Bye.